Hello. Welcome to Move Minneapolis's Commute Revolution 2020. We'll get started shortly. I see a number of you coming in, so um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for coming and welcome to Move Minneapolis's Commute Revolution 2020. I'm your host, Mary Morris Marty, Executive Director at Move Minneapolis. Let's kick this off with a special thanks to our sponsor. Loom, Loom creates commuter benefits software built for employers to better serve commuters. Loom pulls it all together, employee engagement, gamification and rewards, and commuter benefits administration. <clears throat> and we are really delighted for their support. So I gotta say you're in for something very special today. <clears throat> We've assembled the most thought provoking lineup of national transportation writers and analysts ever at a conference, much less in a Zoom room. Like a lot of you, Move Minneapolis is ready for change. Our transportation system relies on cars and trucks, really dangerous, outdated technology. The system we have now is incredibly expensive and inequitable, and it's hurtling us down the road to a climate catastrophe. Our speakers are gonna tell us how we can fix this from a variety of perspectives. We hope they don't mince words. But first, let's take care of a few housekeeping items. So you've all been placed on mute. Don't worry about making noise. Children and dogs are really welcome. Uh, please type your questions in the Q&A box and we'll answer them at the end of each presentation. If the chat box is covering something that you wanna see, just click on it and drag it out of the way with your cursor. And please, by all means, use the Commute Revolution hashtag and tweet with abandon. So Move Minneapolis, you may have never heard of us, but we're a nonprofit and we make sustainable transportation easy. We offer commute management consulting to employers and commercial property owners so that Minneapolis is both competitive and green. We produce this annual transportation summit, the Car Free MSP Commuter Mode Switch Contest, and our signature messaging campaign, Move Like a Boss. You've got to check that one out. We fight for sustainable communities, a climate-friendly future, an equitable economy, and a world we'd all like to live in. We're ready for a transportation revolution, and so are today's speakers. Please bookmark our website. It's moveminneapolis.org. It's entirely new as of last week, and we're really excited about it, and we think you'll love it. So while you're there, um, you can sign up for our newsletter and keep in touch with what's happening in Minneapolis. Uh, before our, pro our program begins, here's a very special message from some very special and very favorite Minneapolis Hall leaders. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. And it's an honor to share some thoughts with you as you gather for the Transportation Summit today. When I look back over the last 10 years in Minneapolis, I'm really proud of the work that we have done together to 
reimagine streets, not just as places for cars to drive quickly through our communities, but as community assets that support race equity in everything from the design of our capital budget to the design of individual intersections in our city that support safe walking, biking, and transit as modes that we're inviting people to use that support our commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and using the public right of way as a place of health and healing for our environment and our communities. And when I look out for the next 10 years, I know that as we enter a really difficult time, we need to redouble those commitments. Yes, to sustainability. Yes, to creating those spaces for community, but also to really redouble our efforts in diversifying our own profession and our institutions, to really lean into redefining expertise and making sure that the right people are at the table when decisions are getting made. And to think about how we can collectively repair the harm that our profession has caused in the past. And I know that all of those things are possible because of all of you and the work that you're doing to lead us through change, to lead our profession through change, to lead our, lead our communities through change. So I'm so thankful for all that you are doing. You inspire me. Thank you. Hi, uh, Councilman Kevin Reich, uh, City of Minneapolis, also a board member of MOVE Minneapolis. Uh, one of the things I've really come to appreciate about our current transportation system is how much intentional uh, thought is given to partnership and collaboration uh, from all stakeholders. And I believe Move Minneapolis is a big part of that, uh, particularly for the core uh, hub of downtown Minneapolis, uh, but also knowing that it interrelates with a broader network. Speaking of that broader network, moving forward in the next 10 years, we must get beyond uh, project by project annual budgeting we need to mark out a five to 10 year plan that, that says this is the system that we need, this is the system we'll build, and here are the budgetary commitments to get that done. Um, it's more cost effective, it's more plannerly, and the results speak to the actual need of our region, not only to move people around, move people around well and equitably, but to actually support a competitive global marketplace. That's the work I'm committed to, and Move Minneapolis is certainly a part of that. What's up 2020 Transportation Summit? This is St. Paul City Council Member Mitra Jalali. I'm coming to you from Ward 4, my neighborhood, where I live a short walk away from the Raymond Avenue Green Line stop, a classic, and also uh, walking toward the 87 bus stop right now. And uh, I am talking to you all because I need a ride. I don't have a car anymore. I said goodbye to my car last month. I have changed my lifestyle dramatically to get rid of uh, this giant machine that I used to lug around. And uh, I'm looking to all of you to help make sure folks across the Twin Cities who are transit dependent can get to where they need to go. Uh, I would love instead of um, uh, fighting for transit funding that we funded transit so much and so robustly that we were a short ride away from where we're trying to go and that we didn't even have to charge fares for it. I would love if instead of police officers checking for fares we had transit ambassadors who were making sure that people know how to take the train or the bus and uh, have what they need to get situated and I would love if everybody like me could be a short walk away from their transit stop. Uh, part of that is housing policy and making sure people live closer to each other so they can be closer to our transit stops. I'm working on that as council member, but I know you'll fight with me for that too. So here's the 87, shout out to my bus, shout out to y'all, thank you for your advocacy. Have an amazing conference, bye. We love our council members in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and you can see why. So welcome back. We have six fantastic speakers today coming to us from across three time zones, from LA and San Francisco to Cleveland, New York City, and Boston. We invite you to ask questions. Please type them in the Q&A box during each presentation. Either Becky or I will be coming back in to coordinate questions and we'll cover as many as we can as we move along our agenda. So I want to kick off our summit with Matthew Lewis. 
Matt first came to our attention from his exceptionally good Twitter posts around cities, housing, development, climate, and transportation. He's a professional communicator for California Yimby, plus a brand builder and a media strategist who is straightforward about his goals, stating in his profile, I want to solve climate change, end the housing crisis, dismantle car culture, and ride bikes. I think we can all get behind his platform. So happy to have you here, and I'll turn it over to you, Matthew. Okay, I should be unmuted now, and hopefully people can share my screen. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes? Can people hear me? Great, excellent. Um, and hopefully you can also see my screen. So as, as Mary mentioned, my name is Matthew Lewis. I am Director of Communications for California Yimby. Um, California Yimby focuses on solving the housing crisis in California. Uh, we're, we're trying to make California a affordable place to live, work, and raise a family. And we do that by focusing on state housing policy um, uh, and to address and correct the systemic inequities in California housing laws. Um, there's a huge overlap with housing policy and transportation policy. And I would even say they're basically the same thing. Um, and I'm going to get into some particular aspects of that today. And, and, and focus of my talk is how to beat the high cost of driving, which is a consequence to a large degree, as the last speaker mentioned, of, um, of our housing policies. So there's some overlap with, uh, let's see, how do I don't move this forward? There's some overlap with climate policy as well, and California is, is, a, is, a, is a lesson to us all in what to be mindful of uh, um, and looking for the future. Um, and I'm gonna get into some of that as well. But for starters, um, Let's talk about what things cost. So in California, we're in the process of building a high speed rail system and the costs have been ballooning and this has been all over the news. Oh my gosh, this train is so expensive. Uh, the cost grew $2 billion. It's now up to nearly $80 billion for a high speed train that will take you from the Bay Area down to Los Angeles. Oh my gosh, $2 billion, that's so much money. How could we possibly be spending $2 billion on a train? Um, at, a, at a more granular level, we hear this about things like bike lanes. Um, there was a bike lane in Raleigh, North Carolina. The cost ballooned by $4 million. Oh my gosh, $4 million for a bike lane. That's outrageous, isn't it? That's so much money. Well, but hold on a second. Where does the money come from for transportation and how is it spent? How often do we compare uh, what we spend on transportation across different modes. And, and that's something that I like to do. And so it's one of the reasons why I'm here today. Um, right here, just not just down the street from where they're building uh, the terminal for this high-speed train is a very famous bridge. It's the Bay Bridge. It connects Oakland and the East Bay to San Francisco. Well, that project went a little over budget, 2,500% um, over budget to be exact. And that one bridge cost $6.5 billion. So we had one bridge that went $6.5 billion over budget and a train that went $2 billion over budget. The bridge was controversial too. Nobody missed the fact that it costs a lot, but that was one bridge. Um, there was a tunnel in Seattle that also went a little over, over budget. That's also, by the way, the bridge on the Bay Bridge, uh, it's only for cars. They built a bike lane, but it didn't go all the way across. You can only go to the island and then ride back to Oakland. You can't actually ride your bike from Oakland to San Francisco. That's a tragedy that cyclists all over the Bay Area are fighting to correct. Um, here's another one in Seattle. Uh, uh, the tunnel project, the Seattle Viaduct, uh, about a quarter billion dollars over budget. And then I know we're, we're not gonna get into Boston. There's a Boston discussion later, um, but there were some very funny things done about how over budget the big dig was. Uh, and one, th one story pointed out that the Euro tunnel, which actually brought trains from London to the European mainland uh, was cheaper than the big dig um, by, by, by quite a lot, even though that was also over budget. And I think that the, the, the point that you start to realize when you look at the cost of trains and bike lanes and transit systems is in comparison to what we spend on infrastructure that is exclusively for the use of cars, it's actually a pretty good deal. Caltrans, 
which is the California Transportation Agency that maintains all our highways and does most of the spending in the state around roads, roads and bridges and that sort of thing. Their annual budget is $20 billion. So when people say to me things like the high-speed rail are very expensive, um, with a total cost of $80 billion for the whole system, I point out that that's just four years of spending that we put into pavement in the state of California. And that money is, is spread out over 30 years because we know we finance transportation projects over a very long time. So in the context of an annual highway budget, just for highways and streets of $20 billion, is $80 billion really that much money? Um, let's go a little deeper. Americans spend a, a $1.4 billion every day on gasoline. Uh, that's every day of the year. Um, so is, is, uh, is $20 billion, is, is $80 billion for a train? That's 80 days, that's 60 days more or less of US gasoline expenses. Um, starting to sound like maybe these things aren't as expensive as we think they are. Um, now let's get to some real numbers. You know, you talk about a trillion here and a trillion there, eventually you're talking about real money. In the United States, people spend $1.4 trillion a year on cars. That's car sales, that's car parts, that's gasoline, that's all the retail activity around cars. $1.4 trillion per year. That's almost 25% of all US retail spending. Now, granted, there's businesses at the other end of that. There's a huge ecosystem of industry and jobs and all that stuff that goes along with the cars that people are spending the money on. But the point remains, there's a lot of money being spent on transportation. In fact, trillions of dollars being spent on transportation. And the money is there. It's just a question of how do we prioritize it? Well, in the United States, as we all know, um, we prioritize it for things that look like this. Uh, $200 billion per year, that's about how much American states and cities and the federal government contribute to our road infrastructure. Um, now, that's uh, uh, the problem with that number, in addition to it, you know, a lot of that going to new highways that make traffic worse and add more cars to the system, um, is it's actually not enough. Um, one of the things that we've learned uh, uh, over the last many years is that uh, funding for the state highways, which comes from fees on, you know, such as gas taxes and registration fees, is nowhere near sufficient to maintain the roads that we already have. And as you can see, this is some information from the Highway Trust Fund projections. Um, the, the trust fund goes bankrupt uh, or somewhere around this year and is now in perpetual um, deficit until we start to figure out a way to raise money for it. That gap between the yellow line and the blue line is the difference between revenues and outlays, which means we're in a steadily increasing deficit, as far as the eye can see, on our highway and road spending. Um, if you add it all up, highway spending, the amount Americans spend on cars and retail, uh, it's about $2 trillion per year. That to me sounds like a lot of money. I don't know about you guys, but I can't write a check for a trillion bucks. But I do know that if I had $2 trillion per year for transit and for bike lanes, I think we could make a pretty fantastic transformation of how our transportation system works in this country. Um, also, there's some important caveats to that $2 trillion. It's actually not a comprehensive figure because there's a $3 trillion backlog in our existing road and bridge infrastructure. That's how much money we need to fix the roads we already have. Um, and those are only the direct costs. It doesn't include the cost of traffic. Enrix estimated that uh, we, we lose about $300 billion a year in, in productivity to people sitting in traffic. And of course, there's some things that speakers will speak about later, uh, 40,000 fatalities a year, 2 million injuries per year, and air pollution and climate impacts that we don't even know how to quantify fully. Air pollution is, pretty, is one of the leading killers in the United States, but the climate impacts that we're seeing are just ballooning and ballooning, and these, these liabilities are um, compounding with time. So where will all the money come from? Well, we know we have the money. We're spending the money, trillions of dollars per year for a system that we are all in agreement, I think, isn't really working for us anymore. So there's another piece of this. And, and I know there's one thing that I want to make sure we, we do talk about is that the impacts of the way these monies are spent are grossly inequitable. We have set up a system of transportation in the United States that makes it even more difficult for lower income workers to participate in the economy and they're penalized worse because of their requirement to own a car. That is a huge expense. People don't realize like, oh, well you can buy, you know, you can, if, if you need it, you can get a cheap car. A cheap car still costs you five to $10,000 every year to maintain. And if you're on a low income, if you're on a fixed income, 
that's not exactly the kind of money you have lying around. A lot of workers in the United States are one broken axle, one broken alternator from being unable to get to work. And that's a huge problem in our, in our country. And it's something that, um, that I think we have an obligation to address as a part of an agenda that really is focused on making our cities more equitable. Um, we've seen stories about what the car industry has been trying to do to uh, keep people in cars, such as um, extending subprime loans to car buyers. Uh, there's, there were a number of articles last fall before the coronavirus uh, hit about the number of car loans that were completely underwater. This story was about, you know, started with a guy who owns 45, who owes the car industry $45,000 for a $27,000 loan he took for a car. That is just insane. That is not a sustainable way to, to move yourself around in, in the United States in 2020. Um, in fact, the amount of money that Americans are spending on cars is so high that if we actually, it, as a thought experiment, if we actually stop spending that money on cars, you would actually turn most Americans into millionaires. Now this is slightly hyperbolic, but only slightly, because the lifetime expense of owning a car here is close to $500,000. If you put that money into say, an index fund over the course of your life and rode transit and rode a bicycle, by the time you were 60, you would have $2 million in your bank account. That's a lot of money. So we know we've got the money. Um, we also know we have to do something and we got to do something soon. We've now learned in California that the vehicle electrification revolution we've heard about has not arrived on time and we're now going to have to completely overhaul the transportation system in the state to get there. How are we going to get there? That's one question. That's why we're having these debates here about the cost of the train versus the cost of how much we spend on highways because there isn't only but so much money uh, to spend on all these systems and we need to rethink how we're prioritizing that money if we're going to address these problems. Um, one of the things that we've now concluded in, in, in California, we have the California Air Resources Board, which sort of guides us on this, is we're gonna have to redirect billions of dollars in transportation and housing funding. And I think that housing piece is really key. Remember, I'm a EMB, I work with California EMB, so yes, of course, I'm focused on the housing, but all of these things connect. We need to be prioritizing funds for infill housing, affordable housing in particular, subsidized housing for low-income workers, closer in to where the jobs are, closer to our cities, in our cities, near where schools are, near healthcare, near daycare, if we're going to solve these problems. And that includes the climate problem, which is the big sort of hanging fire over all of us that, uh, that transportation is now increasingly important to, uh, to solving. Um, we know that it's getting worse and because of how we're treating housing. So the housing crisis has been a direct cause of increasing pollution from transportation in California. In fact, transportation is now responsible for about half of the climate pollution in California. And in the United States, it's the single largest source of pollution um, is from driving around so much. So the, 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 the proximate cause of this, again, is we're forcing people to move further and further away from where, uh, to live further and further away from where they work. And we've got to bring them back. We've got to create more housing closer to where they work to solve that problem. Um, the blunt conclusion, Californians have to drive less. That's a very difficult thing for a lot of Californians to hear, but if we're going to solve climate change, uh, we're going to have to do that. And frankly, if we're going to make more equitable communities, that's also going to have to be true because access to schools, access to amenities um, uh, is, is a part of this transportation equation. And you cannot solve that unless you solve this problem of housing and transportation, which again, are the same thing. Um, the, the upshot is we've seen pollution rising again, and um, I have, there's no love lost between me and, and the car industry, in spite of some friends who, who love cars, I, I love them as well. We have some differences around that particular topic. But the reality is the car industry is an SUV industry, and if you look at what the International Energy Agency has been saying, um, all these lines are the trend lines of SUV sales. So this is a global phenomenon. The car industry has decided SUVs are the future for it, at least for now. There is some electric vehicle future that is always a future. It doesn't seem to be a present. But all these increases in SUV sales pretend pretty bad news for pollution over the, over the medium to long term. The average car on Earth is about 13 years old. So a car sold in 2020 to get 20 miles per gallon is going to be on the road getting 20 miles per gallon in about 2032, 2033. That's a huge problem for our pollution objectives and climate objectives. Um, Consumers also don't know about electric vehicles. And the large reason is that the car industry is not really promoting them. Uh, even in California, which has the most aggressive, uh, largest electric vehicle market in the United States, people aren't buying them. You can go to them to, this, to, the, to the car dealership. They're not really trying to sell them. 
Um, it's just not happening yet. Now, I have high hopes, and I really do believe we need to electrify the fleet and make that transition. Um, but we're going to have to force the car industry to do it. And so far, if you've noticed, the Trump administration, electrifying cars is not their priority. Um, we're going to need a change in administration. We're going to need a change in, pri in priorities. But the reality is that until the car industry is forced to do this, uh, they know how they're making money. Um, they've been pretty transparent about it. Uh, they're focused on building and selling SUVs. Um, they've been telling uh, the auto industry has been telling us for years that they need the money, the revenues from SUVs to pay for the electric vehicle tr uh, uh, transition. I don't think that's a fair trade. Um, at least they've been honest about it. But the reality is, you know, we're going to have to look to other ways to solve these problems until the auto industry is ready to play along. Um, so how do we do this? And this is where I think EMBs and transportation advocates and, and equity advocates and, and the folks focusing on all these really have a lot of overlap in what we're trying to achieve. And in particular, in the mechanisms we've got to address to solve the problems. Um, you can barely read this. I really, really hope everybody will go check out the recent paper by Giulio Mattoli uh, about um, the political economy of, of, of transportation infrastructure. Incredible reading for those of you who are into this. And I think everybody on this is into it. But well, he puts it pretty straightforward. Historically, roads were used by a variety of transport modes, including walking, horse-drawn vehicles, trams, and bicycles. What happened? Well, we all know what happened. We gave all the land to cars. <laughs> this is a map I drew a couple years ago that got some attention. Um, that green space in the middle, uh, that is the amount of pavement that is dedicated exclusively to cars in the city of San Francisco. It's about 250 million square feet, if I recall correctly. Um, that's in San Francisco. That's the most expensive land of the United States. We're giving it to cars. And by give, I mean the drivers only pay 25% of the cost of owning and maintaining that land. The rest of San Franciscans, they subsidize that. So that's a huge cost that we're just sort of granting to folks. Um, uh, oh, am I getting pinged here? I think I'm okay. All right. I'm going to keep going. Uh, I can't see the chat. Um, I'm almost done here. So. Um, there's been some great mapping work that's shown how this plays out across the country. Um, and here's, here's a map that, uh, of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Milwaukee is 54% uh, uh, rights of way and pavement for cars and parking. And, and that phenomenon repeats across the United States. We've just basically taken our downtowns and, our, and, and some of our prime urban real estate, and we've said, you know what, that's just for drivers. Nobody else gets to use that. That's a choice. We can undo that choice. And in fact, I hope that we, that we realize we're going to have to undo that choice if we're going to solve our affordable housing uh, crisis, if we're going to make more equitable communities, if we're going to make more space for people who don't look like us and who don't earn um, the maximum amount of money that a lot of cities are offering now, if we're going to have them in our communities, the teachers, the restaurant workers, we are going to have to confront this problem of how we are allocating urban space. It is not ours. It does not belong to cars. It's supposed to be a more equitable system, or at least I dream of it being a more equitable system. And I think we can get there. One of the facts that, you know, I sort of just always blows my mind, there's 250 million cars in the United States, 2 billion parking spots. What is up with that? <laughs> why, why do we need 10, 10 parking spots per car? That's just a gross misallocation of land um, uh, on the merits. And then when you get into the, the equity issues, it gets even worse. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to need to change, address land use policy. There's some other speakers here who I think are going to get into some of that. I know that's ITDP specialty is dealing with land use policy at the, at the city level. And the other speakers are going to do that as well. But this is stuff we have to do. This is not optional. These are the, the land is a zero sum in our cities, and we've got to reallocate um, that land back to its original use, which is helping humans get around and helping humans live, not just putting cars on it and saying calling it a day. Um, I'm going to end with some some examples of how we've done this in California. This is a BRT system that's getting ready to open soonish in uh, in downtown San Francisco. Um, residents fought it. Um, but we finally got it done. We need more people fighting to get it done. That's really the bottom line here, is we need to build this movement for transit in our cities. Um, it's got to be bigger. Uh, we've got to be louder. We've basically just got to shout down the folks who don't want any change. I mean, that's a lot of what this comes down to, is it's a political fight, and um, a lot of the voices who've been preventing this from happening have been dominating the conversation. So I know some folks get upset about how loud uh, folks can be in this conversation, but the reality is the reason things are the way they are is that the loud voices have been calling for stasis instead of making the changes we need. So I hope more voices come in who are loudly saying, yes, I want transportation equity. Yes, I want housing downtown and not just parking for, for the people who drive in from, from the suburbs or wherever. Um, 
bike lanes also controversial. You'll recognize this is actually Market Street. Um, there was a fight in Playa del Rey down in, uh, uh, outside of Venice a couple years ago where people were just completely proclaimed about a bike lane that was proposed. Um, the bike lane won because the advocates showed up in force and said, no, we want to make our streets safer. We want to make it easier to bike around. Um, the good news in this particular case for Market Street is it is now car free. It, uh, a 30 year battle finally completed in January. Um, so now it's mostly for bikes and uh, trams and buses. And it's actually a transportation corridor instead of a car sewer. Um, and I'm going to end with some, just on a personal local note. So this is the North Berkeley BART station. It's about uh, two miles north of where I'm sitting right now. Um, you can see it is a giant parking lot. Uh, one of the things we did uh, last year, two years ago, was we got a law passed in California that made it legal for BART to build mixed use housing on these sites with, uh, with as much affordable housing, low income housing, as it can possibly do. So that's going to be between 30 and 50%, depending on how the funding works. That will transform this neighborhood into a walkable, bikeable neighborhood, as opposed to the 40 mile per hour corridor that's on the right there and a giant parking lot in the middle. Um, this is something that we're going to work on everywhere. You know, we, we need to make this happen everywhere is transform these parking lots into other uses. Um, and I want to just go through and I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up now, but there is history here and it is not pretty. The history of how these places got to look like this is one of the ugliest chapters in American history. And that is the practice of, of racist redlining and of, of racially segregating our communities by plat. We actually drew on these maps, and these are the famous redlining maps. You can find them for all over California. Here's Los Angeles. This is Cincinnati. Um, this is uh, Chicago. Um, you've got uh, the Bronx and, and um, Harlem here and Brooklyn. Um, and then here's East Bay, California, where I live. What, the pattern of these maps is pretty transparent. We're going to put all the people who aren't white over there. We're going to put a highway dividing them off from the jobs and the opportunity and the economic um, opportunities and the hospitals and the schools. And we're going to put all the, the, the amenities on the other side here. And we're going to force people to drive between. We're not going to give them the option of riding bikes or taking buses in transit. That's really what we're trying to undo here is we have got to undo this 100 year history of land use to prioritize the car in order to enable these sort of racially segregated neighborhoods. That's, a, that's at the core of what a lot of UMBs are focused on is correcting these historic inequities. It is hard, this is hard work. But I wanna end finally with, some, with a, a, a piece of, of news that I think is hopeful and um, bicycles are sold out. We've got, a, we've got a situation in the United States where bicycles are sold out. This is not something anybody ever predicted. And so I just want to close by saying, you know, we're in the, we're, we, we, we think that some of these battles are intractable, that they're too hard to win, we'll never overcome them. Things are happening. Things that nobody thought could happen are actually happening. And that makes me very excited. And so I'm going to wrap up there and I'll, I'll take any questions. I don't think I can hear you, Becky. Becky, we can't hear you. Oh, there you go. All right. Becky, we've got no audio. Without audio, I think <laughs> I am going to jump in. Hi. Um, so we, we have a bunch of questions, Matthew. That was pretty amazing. And I don't know if we can put them all into one category because they're all over the place and some are quite significantly um, different from one another. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. I'm back. Can you hear oh. me? Oh, great. Hey, hey. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. I have one really quick question, if that's okay, Mary. I think we've got time for that. Um, Matthew, you mentioned that uh, many people are one broken axle away from not being able to get to work. And um, we've, we've got a question um, related to that, that, that many of these jobs are, are being purposefully located in greenfield developments in the suburbs. And, and you mentioned in your presentation um, about the importance of putting housing where the jobs are. And I guess my question to you is, what about putting jobs near where people live? Um, where does that fit in? It's, so this is, this is the sort of chicken or egg of land use policy 
problem is that businesses locate where they feel like they've got optimal uh, conditions. And that can be a whole host of conditions that they're looking for. That land cost is going to be one, the cost of building a building if they're building one or renting one if they're going to rent an existing space. Um, access to a labor pool is a key com component of, of that consideration. I think that the, at the end of the day, um, the land use policy that the government sets can, have, can play a pretty outsized role and the decisions that businesses make about where they are located. And it's our responsibility, it's our civic responsibility to stand up and make sure that that process includes a consideration for are the workers gonna have to drive three hours to get there from somewhere else? Um, and you're just, you know, let me, give, let me give you a really bad example of how this was done very poorly. Um, the Apple headquarters in Cupertino, okay? This is in the heart of Silicon Valley. They built a 10,000 spot parking lot around the Apple headquarters in Cupertino because they had decided before they ever built the building, we're gonna have people driving from the Central Valley to work for Apple. Government planning, better planning, better rules around, hey, you can't do that. You should build housing there so that the employees can live closer. It could have helped address that, but that's a big, these are not small problems. These are big land use battles and there's huge constituencies and powerful constituencies um, all influencing those decisions. But I, you know, that's not a capricive nature. That is the result of government policy. And we all have an obligation, I think, to engage in that and, and, and make the built environment look the way we want to live. That's great. Um, we have some more questions in the, the Q&A and I just would like to say thank you. And Matthew, we'd love to have you continue answering those. Um, some of the questions about your sources and the, the, the maps and yeah, the article you cited. So that would be wonderful. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Mary, at this time. Great. Um, we are going to have some amazing video now. Um, a, a quick moment of Minneapolis fun. But then I have a current transportation system. Um, it seems to be slanted more towards the people that live in the suburbs. Um, the inner city is kind of just there. They do what they can, not what they should. Um, which makes it more difficult in the inner city to, to get to different places, especially outside of the inner city. So there's not much, it's, it's like there's a cutoff um, when you get to the outer ring suburbs. Unfortunately, that's where some of the jobs are. I don't like how slowly buses move through the core of downtown and our busiest places. I don't like how necessary driving is for so many people. Access seems a little bit difficult in some areas. Uh, for example, Matt Groven area, it takes me about an hour to get downtown Minneapolis, whereas bike ride is about 30 minutes and a car trip is about 16. We don't have a robust train system. You know, the, I lived in Atlanta for a long time. You can get anywhere on the train fairly easily. It's super um, easy to access. And I feel like here it's skeletal at best. Um, I really like the light rail. I wish there were more light rail options, and I wish there were more trams like there used to be. Our transportation system frustrates me because it has facilitated sprawl and low density development for decades. I've been a bicycle commuter for more than 35 years, and I know firsthand that it is not bicycle friendly. I'm on my bike even when it's very cold. And so I've also seen quite a bit of what the road has to offer to bicyclists, which unfortunately is not always a very safe feeling. I mean, there's a lot of challenges right now going on with, with um, transportation. Um, there's equity pieces, in my opinion, that involve the community being able to actually benefit from the things that are supposedly supposed to be bringing opportunity to them. Um, I haven't seen that really pan out in the volume that, you know, would, would show up in a significant way. I wish there was an express that went from downtown Minneapolis to the Capitol. I know a lot of us need to get back and forth during the workday, even on the weekends sometimes, 
And it would be great to go from center points of cities and hubbubs of where things are happening in a super expedited fashion. And then there's just the overall access of different types of mediums of transportation. So whether we're talking vehicles, we're talking public transportation, we're talking bike lanes, um, all of these different things, I think we have a long way to go before we're at a, a healthy medium that services the needs of the communities. The whole system doesn't feel properly balanced. Hi, I just want to say thank you uh, to Matthew and we are looking forward to a, a robust Q&A with him perhaps on Twitter. Um, you, can, you can find that all on our website and we'll talk about that more as we, as we end. So I want to introduce our next speaker, Michael Kodransky. Uh, Michael joined the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy in New York 12 years ago and he's led its U.S. program for a year and a half. He has worked all over the world in the most amazing cities assuring best practices in sustainable transportation and the built-in urban environment. He has particular expertise in shared mobility, bicycle infrastructure, parking policy, and bus rapid transit. And as we did before with Matt's presentation, uh, use the Q&A box for your questions. We will try to get them in. Um, we have an amazing lineup and I think that is going to make questions difficult today. So we'll do what we can and, uh, definitely we'll, we'll come up with a follow-up plan. Uh, it, and feel free, our present, presenters can certainly jump in the, in the Q&A and answer directly there too. All right. Thank you, Michael. I'll turn it over to you. Hi. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you all virtually. I hope you can hear me. This is the first virtual presentation that I'm doing. Uh, and ITDP is an organization that has a presence in many geographies around the world. Uh, so, we are headquartered in New York City. We have a program in the US, but we also work in many other regions and countries. And our mission is to promote sustainable and equitable transport worldwide. And so as part of doing that, we have been quite concerned and trying to uh, work in reforming transport systems to address climate emissions from the transport sector, which make up about a quarter of transport emissions. And so there's this framework that's talked about around the world, avoid, shift, improve. And a lot of our work has really focused on shift, shifting uh, people, uh, governments, local governments, state governments, uh, to a lesser extent, national governments, uh, out of this mindset of funding and designing for long distance trips and uh, car centric planning. And increasingly, we've also been focusing on improve, getting the systems that we have like buses to be electrified. And now we find this conversation happening and in this moment where so many people are teleworking. And this is something that travel demand management professionals have been trying to incentivize for ages and suddenly here we are with this massive experiment of teleworking uh, and in fact in all of the climate modeling we've seen that without the avoid piece the shift piece and the improved piece together there's no way we can get to a scenario where we don't reach the worst consequences of the climate crisis so really we're at a moment where we can ask ourselves what would a fresh start look like? And we all recognize in this summit that something about the way we've designed our systems hasn't been working. We've really prioritized the long distance trip over all of our other needs. And it's left us in a state of questioning our work-life balance in questioning what really matters uh, in the communities that aren't functioning in a way that we would like. We've alienated ourselves from our environments through the investment in this kind of infrastructure. And so a lot of my presentation will 
move around the world to various geographies, referencing various strategies that already have been percolating, that already we can see tangibly are making change. So there's no shortage in the availability of solutions in answering this question of what are the ingredients to a good city. So in the 1960s, uh, Copenhagen was faced in its city center with this scene, parking clogging its central square. In fact, they, have, they had set their policies to allow so much parking in their central square, uh, it looked very much like the center of many American cities today. And ultimately, the government leaders and the people decided this isn't good enough. We've basically relegated pedestrians and all of our activities to the fringes and given over all of our precious, precious space to what is ultimately an idle activity. Parking uh, is idle for 95, cars are idle for 95% of the time. And so the city started to shift its policy direction. And today that same street looks like this. Uh, the Danish architect, Jan Gale, has been promoting this kind of reclamation of city space and neighborhood space for decades. And specifically, uh, you know, designing for what people actually need. And so when Danes are asked, uh, for example, Danes are well known now for cycling, why is it that they cycle? 1% uh, say for the environment, 6% say because it's cheap, 19% say because of exercise, but an overwhelming percent say because of the design, because of the convenience, it's fast and it's easy. And so that's why today you find people in Copenhagen, much like many people in Minnesota, uh, riding their bikes in the dead of winter because the design makes it comfortable, attractive and appealing and the way to go. And so Jan Gale has really in promoting for reclamation of our spaces, a concept of nibbling away at, at the former infrastructure. And so we have many examples now around the world of these healthy nibbles, taking away parking spaces uh, to try to shift the infrastructure to not just conform to getting us from point A to point B, but also to allow us to use those spaces because they're public spaces, in fact, for lingering activities. And of course, those two functions that a street enables have some friction. And so we have to decide what are our societal values in how we want to see the public realm. And so these healthy nibbles, we're seeing them all over the world. Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, restaurants, are all we're talking about in this age of restaurants with physical distancing, we already have a baseline for how that might work. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about slow streets. Uh, in, in transport engineering, uh, there's a nomenclature for arterials, collector streets, and now in the Vision Zero movement, we're focusing on speed, but maybe we should be redefining our streets around function. So these are examples of, of streets that allow play. And if we're going to be telecommuting, uh, giving more space for kids to be able to use their streets for these kinds of activities. Uh, the famous Viennese professor, Hermann Knopflacher, has for a long time showed the spatial intensity that parking function takes up in our cities with the creation of his walkmobile. And here you see a photo uh, of him in his walkmobile. And he's pointed out that we've essentially designed our cities to make driving the most convenient way of getting around. And of course, metropolitan areas are larger than they've ever been. The functions within them are spread across many more distances than they ever have been. So uh, we prioritize the design so you can get in your car, 
by just going down to the garage in your basement, using the elevator, and you're there. Meanwhile, the public transit stop has to compete because it's a few blocks away. And so now in this age of social distancing, another fellow in Toronto has shown really how much space we would need if we were properly following health guidelines uh, on our streets. And really there's the question, is there any space for parking with this new reality on our streets? Uh, parking has of course also taken up space in our buildings, as I mentioned, the convenience of going in the elevator and reaching your parking spot. And you see the spatial intensity, how many other activities we can have in the space that's taken up by parking. Matt uh, mentioned how much parking there is across the US. Uh, Angie, who's going to follow me, has done a great job of documenting parking creators around the US. We've basically given up life in our cities to uh, asphalt. And so we really should rethink what are the higher values that we, we see purpose for these spaces. And ITDP came out with a graphic to show, well, with the space that a, a parking spot takes up, you could have affordable housing. You could have the equivalent of a studio apartment in Paris. You could have lots of other modes uh, that are supported for that actually support shorter trips rather than driving activity, which is basically for a longer trip. And ITDP has been doing some work around uh, gender access and racial demographic breakdown uh, of different transportation needs uh, around the world. And so in the US, about 16% of commuting trips, uh, of 16% of, of trips are commuting trips. So we've designed all of our infrastructure, as I've been saying, for these long distance uh, trips. And a study in Santiago, Chile found that uh, almost 50% of trips were in fact uh, for caretaking. And so it, we haven't designed our infrastructure for these other types of short distance trips that actually dominate the total volume of trips that are taken in, in cities. And so you see in some of our research how uh, the gender breakdown has, ha has impacted people differently in, in the way that the infrastructure has been designed. So it's very much been designed to support the male commuter going from home to work. But in fact, caretakers and specifically uh, mothers, grandmothers, they make many more short trips and they're not often traveling during the peak time. And there are many stops along the way, even if they're ultimately going to get to the same distance of destination of work in the end. In the US, in fact, the, the studies, the statistics all show that the majority of trips are short trips. Uh, and in this era, there's new data coming out of Google. They've been tracking uh, some of the changes in people's mobility habits and you see that there has been a precipitous drop in trips to transit stations, in trips to workplaces, which is not such a surprise to us. While there's an increase uh, of activity to parks uh, and to uh, residential areas. And so here's a snapshot of how that looks in Minnesota. It's like the national trend, uh, a severe drop of trips to transit stations, severe drop of trips to offices, workplaces, uh, and really a surge uh, of trips to parks and residential areas. And so we've predicated all of our funding, all of our uh, energy in, real, in really prioritizing these long distance trips. And so we've built highways everywhere and often have talked about what to do with highways that reach their point of obsolescence and think of that point of obsolescence as just being a maintenance question. But there is a larger question related to the function of those highways. Do they still serve the function of the society that we want and the, the cities that we want uh, with the ingredients that we think are important? So ITDP has looked at how to take some of this kind of infrastructure, elevated urban highways, 
to reimagine it as part of a seismic shift. So this is a street in Guangzhou, China with an elevated highway. And we've been promoting for many years for that elevated highway to become a high line uh, with transit below, better pedestrian access, cycling access, and greater priority for short distance trips. Now, of course, some people will need to take long distance trips. We're seeing essential workers are still using transit. Transit will still be needed, uh, but we need to focus much more on short distance trips. And if we want solutions to, to work now, parking is a low hanging fruit. It's been taking up a lot of space and we already know when we reimagine parking, when we reframe different neighborhoods uh, and streets that people move differently and they have different expectations of their neighborhoods. So here's a street in uh, Vientiane in Laos uh, that has primarily focused on the priority of driving to this market parking, uh, market shopping street. And it's been reimagined around a BRT station. So the parking has been taken out, bike station, has been put in for uh, shared bikes. And this is the nexus of a new neighborhood. And that's the moment that I think we're in, in imagining how to enable better short distance travel in our neighborhoods. Because essentially by, by planning for these long distance trips with elevated highways, we've made the neighborhood an afterthought. We're seeing the, we've seen the emergence of scooters and, and e-bikes in the last years. And so there's really a question as there have been many private companies that have enabled for us to experience and experiment with these new modes. Uh, what is their place as we uh, move into the emerging future? And so the OECD just came out with a report showing how e-scooters and e-bikes might factor into enable better travel for long distance trips. And uh, they've been promoting something called lit lanes, which ITDP promotes too, uh, light individual transport lanes. And so in cities, we've, we've looked at cycling lanes uh, as a way to, to, to enable long distance, low carbon travel. But now with these other modes, maybe we should think bigger and use language that includes them. And so finally, uh, I wanted to posit this. What if in thinking about how we should support transport systems going forward, we reimagine designing them around caretaker needs? How would they actually look? Caretakers often are less mobile, have strollers, have packages, uh, and have many burdens with the current, current paradigm that perhaps in the new reality we embrace, uh, we can make our cities work for all by focusing our, on those who are already overburdened. So thank you, I welcome your question. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Um, I'm going to start it out with a question from Amity Foster in Minneapolis. How do we address what's unspoken but a huge barrier? Transit, biking, walking, it all takes more time than driving. Cars provide a short-term ease of movement. How do we change people's mindset around how much time getting around should take? And are there incentives we should give to people who commit to taking transit who make that shift. And I should say thank you to Matthew also for answering that. I think, I think I'd, I'd love to hear um, um, your perspective as well, Michael. So uh, there are studies that show with each increment of 15 minutes, the burden that people feel from the commute uh, incrementally, it, 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 the commuter pain increases. And of course, our economies have been organized around these huge metropolitan distances. And I think we're at a moment where our economies are starting to reshift in the land use and the transport policies that we design. Uh, 
trying to bake in the, the, the existing shorter trips, trying to keep the existing shorter trips that we already see emerging, trying to enable them much more. There will be some flow of long distance trips. It might not be a hundred percent shift. Uh, so I'm not sure I have a good answer. And that's, a, that's, that's okay. Um, I, I think it's something we're all wrestling with. Um, you know, I was pretty astounded by that, that data that you showed with the, the um, changes, um, um, the baseline um, changes in, in um, Minnesota. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on what we should do about that increase in recreational, and I forget what the last one was. Where, where do we go with this information and make data-driven decisions? As I was referencing, I think now the neighborhood and making sure that we have complete neighborhoods and, and streets that enable complete neighborhoods and land uses that enable complete neighborhoods, essentially we've, we've uh, and Matthew uh, mentioned this, we, we've allowed for the separation of uses across our cities and across our metro regions so that you couldn't really do all the functions essential to your life within walking or cycling distance. And we, we didn't really question that paradigm. And now since we're in a moment of refresh, we can. And what it would mean to really invest in the resilience of neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Great. So I've got a question here from um, Emily Wade in Minneapolis. And you know, one of the themes um, that we purposely focused on and that the panelists are focusing on here today is equity. And I would like to just acknowledge that um, I'm white, nearly all the panelists here are white. And at the same time, we have many black indigenous and people of color leaders across the country, um, especially women of color who are outspoken about the future and um, are sharing the challenges facing our transportation system. And this is a really a question for all our presenters today. You know, wondering how do, how, how do um, white panelists, white, the white presenters here today make sure that they are centering BIPOC leaders and BIPOC members of their own communities. When, when, when it, do you step back and let others lead? How do you credit um, BIPOC thinkers, professionals, advocates, and activists um, when you know, drawing upon their visions, um, tactics? Uh, I will say this, future. in Thanks. our work of focusing on gender and, and race uh, uh, in different countries, which uh, we've probably done uh, the greatest work in our, our Brazil office. Uh, women of color especially have reported, and I think this goes to the crux of, we need to ask people who are using these systems how they're experiencing them. They feel a sense of harassment, they feel a, a sense of unsafety, uh, not just uh, uh, unsafety from speeding vehicles, but unsafety in terms of surveillance and, and other aspects of how we design the transport system. So. I think from that work, there are two takeaways. Uh, well, there are many more takeaways, but the two that I think really percolate to the top for me are we need to ask those who are using the system what their experiences are, and we need to include people of color in positions of leadership and women in leader positions of leadership and part of the conversation. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have another, another great question. Um, uh, from Tanya Pass, thank you for recognizing the focus of design and resources on traditionally male commuter trips versus caretakers, traditionally female. What if we designed for the um, for people with disabilities, um, kind of a universal design, and wouldn't that then work for all? Your thoughts on that? You know, kind of I design think it goes elements. I think it goes back to the question of. Uh, engaging those who are actually using the system. And I was really taken some years ago in talking to the transit agency in Barcelona that they were designing their uh, payment kiosk. And they in fact asked blind people to navigate the existing payment kiosk and to comment on what was working and what wasn't working. And so we, we often don't put in that due diligence in our planning. 
And so I think if you want to design for all, then there needs to be an effort in engaging people who have various disabilities to get their, their idea of what a good system could look like. Thanks. We have time for one more question. I'm going to go to uh, Cole Hineker. Um, brings up a great point about carpooling. Neither, neither of our presenters so far have talked about carpooling, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Michael. He writes, one fewer driver in car is good either way, right? Tell, what about carpooling? Um, you know, it's funny because the last image on my slide was actually of the ABC ramps in Minneapolis, which I think Move Minneapolis manages the carpooling program. At least there's there's some signage within. In right. The ramps. Thanks for that shout uh, out, Michael. <laughs> uh, so, of course, um, right now I don't think anybody has a good answer for carpooling. Just like the answer for how do we how do we uh, deal with uh, trans support transit that has basically functioned on an economic model of crowding uh, in this era of physical distancing for public health needs on a 40 foot bus. And I think the same goes for carpooling. Nobody has a good answer. Right. It's still, it's still in the emerging future. Right. Well, Thank you so much. That's all the time we've got for, for questions. I encourage you to um, keep typing answers in the chat and for, to, for, uh, that please, to all our attendees, please keep, keep putting them in there. Thanks, Thank Becky you. and Mary. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. That was amazing. And to uh, reiterate what Becky just said, get into the chat. It's really heating up. It's a lot of fun and place your questions in Q&A. We'll have our presenters uh, respond to questions we don't have time for in the Q&A. So, so we don't want to leave anyone out. We're going to figure out ways to, to answer you in as many channels as we can. Uh, so I am really excited. Our next speaker is Angie Schmidt. Um, Angie is a former planner, spent nine years writing so well about cities and transportation for Streets Blog USA. I'm excited for her upcoming book. You may have seen some, some pre-press reviews that were stellar. Um, it's on pedestrian safety and it's going to be released later this summer, sounds like August. Um, and she's gonna join us by video. She's not live today, but she has some, some interesting and challenging thoughts for us. Um, after we hear from her, we're gonna take a slightly longer break so you can grab a sandwich. Uh, and we'll get started again around 12.20. Hi there, uh, my name is Angie Schmidt. I'm a writer who's been writing about transportation issues for a long time, most recently at Streets Blog. Now I'm working on a book um, that will be published by Island Press in August. It's gonna be called Right of Way and it's about the pedestrian safety crisis in America. Um, so today I'm going to try to get you guys excited about telecommuting. Um, and I know that a lot of people in this field, you know, we didn't get into this business because we were really excited about telecommuting. But I'm going to try to convince you, um, and here's why. Um, so the number one reason is it's easy. Um, in the United States, we've been sort of succeeding at increasing telecommuting for a while now, even without much effort on the part of planners. And uh, even more so than modes that we've put a lot of effort into, like biking and transit. Um, during this pandemic, it's been much more apparent. We now have, by certain estimates, about 50% of the U.S. workforce telecommuting to work. Um, and what we've seen, and one of the good reasons to promote telecommuting, is um, a pretty significant decline in emissions. Um, telecommuting, one reason I think telecommuting should be more actively promoted and could be really beneficial is obviously for the environmental benefits. Since this recession, or since this pandemic recession started, um, about mid-March, you know, driving miles have really fallen off a cliff. Um, some people estimate that gasoline sales are down about 50% to give you a sense. So um, 
Not all of that is telecommuting, of course. People are avoiding leisure trips. Um, tele uh, commuting really is only about 20% of trips in the United States. But still, it's pretty massive. It's enough to, uh, the reduction in driving is enough to reduce carbon emissions this year globally by about 8%. And that's almost exactly where we need to be annually to meet our goals for um, to remain under two degrees Celsius increase in um, average temperature. So what we need to avoid the worst impacts of a climate crisis, we've managed to do sort of overnight just by reducing driving a lot. And one thing I will say about that is um, it's almost all these light vehicles too, cars and trucks that consumers are using. Um, diesel fuel sales have not been affected too much and neither has electricity during this. So I think this is a moment, if there's some lessons we can learn from the p pandemic, and I know other people are gonna be talking about other lessons, this is a really obvious one, that we can really, really have a big environmental impact um, with these telecommunications tools and using those to substitute for trips. Um, and not just commuting trips. So commuting, as I mentioned, is about 20% of trips, but there's also potential. Uh, I know people aren't real fond of socializing using Zoom. I just hear a lot of complaining about it. But I think there's also potential beyond just commuting trips to avoid a lot of running around that's a little bit unnecessary or maybe not as necessary as we think. For example, using Zoom for meetings, to um, meet people virtually instead of everyone hopping on transit or hopping in a car. I think there's a lot of potential for that and to uh, reduce trips that way also. Um, so the other reason I want to talk about, there's some other reasons I think we should be looking to expand telecommuting beyond just environmental. Um, one reason is uh, the issue of protections for labor and for better, a better environment for employees. Um, telecommuting offers a couple benefits for employees potentially. Um, it's it's more accessible to people with certain disabilities. So more we could have a more inclusive workforce if this was an option for more people. Um, for certain for certain groups, especially demographics that are really um, pressed for time, like working mothers, um, it can offer a little bit of flexibility in their schedule. If you can avoid an hour of commuting every day, that could be really game changing for certain groups like young parents. Now already as this at this stage in the pandemic, we're hearing talk about, you know, whether commercial real estate is going to come back and maybe employers will continue telecommute, allowing their employees to telecommute indefinitely. And some tech employers specifically, like Twitter and Google, have um, Twitter already said they may not require employees to come back at all. So I did some informal surveying just of my Twitter followers and um, people are really sort of split on whether they have enjoyed teleworking in the last few months. Now obviously people are under this added stress of it being um, of it being a pandemic and the stress about that and a lot of people have their children home, they don't have childcare, so that's adding to the stress. But uh, in my survey, it, people were sort of split about whether they liked telecommuting more or whether they liked reporting to an office more. And I don't think it's sort of an, a one-size-fits-all solution, but I do think that this pandemic shows there's a lot of potential to increase it and potential to increase telecommuting quickly and that it can have big environmental benefits. It can be implemented over the short term and make us more resilient and potentially it can have spillover social benefits for workers. So I think this is something that more employers should consider offering. And there, there's alternatives to just tell everyone telecommutes all the time. That's sort of the extreme end. And what we've seen in the past is that's been reserved for the highest income workers. So certain tech jobs are very friendly to telecommuting. Meanwhile, people on the lower ends of the spectrum haven't had that opportunity as much. But according to Brookings, um, during this pandemic, even in the lowest income quartile, 
um, about 40% of workers have been working from home. So there is potential for more people across the income range to take advantage of this and to potentially benefit from it. So I think planners should get more involved in encouraging this and promoting this. Um, and maybe, like I said, it's not necessarily five days a week, you never show up to the office. Maybe there's a more flexible arrangement where um, the New York Times reported some businesses in Manhattan, for example, are considering maybe employees report two days a week so that they still have that time to collaborate and build relationships. Or maybe they report on an as-needed basis for, um, for important meetings and that kind of thing. And that's a situation that wouldn't lead to these negative impacts um, potentially as much for cities and for urban real estate. So, um, but I noticed there's not, but planners as a profession haven't done a lot to promote this. We've been out there really promoting biking, really promoting transit, which is good and important. Um, but this is something that can be available to a wider range of the public. People who live in areas that aren't well served by transit can may have an environmental impact, can reduce their driving trips this way. So I think it makes the profession a little bit more inclusive. If we include this in the menu of things we're encouraging to sort of rise to the challenge of climate change and some of these other issues of congestion we have in major cities. But we know from the inner intergovernmental panel on climate change that in order to meet our climate goals, we not only have to convert our entire entire vehicle fleet to electric vehicles in the next decade, and we have to clean the grids so that we're fueling those vehicles with renewables. We also have to reduce the number of trips we're making by kind of a lot. We have to, their modeling shows we have to reduce trip, trip making. We have to either shift from single occupancy vehicles or we have to um, just eliminate those trips by 20%. So that's really a heavy lift. And there are certain places like Minneapolis is really on the forefront of this with its 2040 plan, I think is you know the, among the best in the country, if not the best in the country at trying to figure this out and reduce vehicle trips in the city. But um, this is a way we can sort of lower the bar and make that happen. 20% of trips is a lot. So, in, in, it's hard to imagine us really reaching that point in the near future without this tool, without telecommuting. Um, but I noticed, but planners haven't been doing a lot to promote this, like I mentioned. Like I noticed, I, I just did a keyword search in the 20, Minneapolis 2040 plan. Um, that's about 1,200 pages and there was no mention of telecommuting. So I think us as planners, we, we all, you know, our hearts are really in biking, transit, walking, you know, accessibility, those things are important. Um, but I, I think that, that we should sort of broaden our perspective um, in light of what we've learned during this pandemic and um, try to keep some of this momentum going in the future and try to provide this as an option for people. So thank you for having me uh, here from Cleveland and uh, I hope you guys have a great conference. Wasn't that great? I just loved it. I can tell you now that it is sandwich time, soup time, um, but don't be gone long because we have some pretty great taped community voices. People from the streets of Minneapolis, our community, who are thinking hard about transportation during these special times. So our break will last seven or eight minutes. Uh, feel free to pop in and out. And we will see you again at about 12, 25, 26. So thank you. How should we make walking, biking, and transit easier? Transit should really focus on providing reliable, transparent, easy transportation for those that need it most. Um, one of the things that we need is reliability and consistency in terms of our transit system. There's actually a bus stop right in front of my house. And so I see how often people use public transportation. Um, sometimes the buses run on time, sometimes they don't. Um, so I think that that consistency is very important. We live in Minnesota. <laughs> And in order for people to be able to um, utilize transit, they need to feel safe and comfortable. And I think that all bus stops should have heat. Um, they should have lighting. They should have emergency call boxes and things like that. 
one way that we can make these things easier is by learning from how we're living now. I have been biking so much more, walking so much more, really stretching where I can get to with modes of transportation that are environmentally friendly, that are easy, accessible, and I hope that we can continue to find ways to help folks, whether it's changing their work-life balance, changing our expectations of where we are and how we are during the workday, um, where we build up density so that it's easier to be places and get to areas where you can do a bunch of commerce or other things all in one place. I think you'd have to redesign the communities. I think that the fact that so much of what people want access to is outside of their communities that it makes it really difficult. One piece of this is the built environment where we have great lighting and sidewalks that are clear in the winter and a bike lane that feels comfortable and easy to use. Through all the land use and transportation decisions we make together to make beautiful places that are a joy to walk by and through. The more of us that are walking, the easier it is because it sets the example. We need a complete connected network of protected bikeways for active transportation. I would like to see us improve by taking a more holistic approach to how we design our roadways for cyclists so that we can think about strategies that work everywhere and implement them everywhere. I actually led a group of um, women of color in um, group rides last year and the year before and we called ourselves the Cycle Sisters. And I remember we were on a certain bike ride, I can't remember what, um, I think it was last year, where we were riding down Plymouth Avenue. And Plymouth Avenue has a wonderful protected bike lane. And the women on the ride kept saying over and over again about how safe they felt and how, um, how they really enjoyed that ride because they remember just feeling very, very safe and protected being, um, on a protected bike lane, which, which is a, um, a concrete wall or separation from the cars and the bikes. And so I think that really played a big role in folks who just don't bike very often or haven't biked in many years in, in making them feel more comfortable and getting on a bike and riding in the street. You know, the bike lanes have been really helpful. Um, when they started to kind of get those, that map of, of bikes places where you can ride. But what would make it easier is also access to bikes. So we're in COVID right now. Where do you go to get a bike? I try to get five bikes for my family members. Where do you go to get them? I know there's a ton of bikes at the University of Minnesota through the Reuse It program. How do we get those bikes to people? Maybe your employer helps pay for your commuting, um, even if that's deferring the cost of transit or um, paying for part of your commuting bike. I think some cultural changes need to happen first, such as being more relaxed, being more willing to go with the flow, taking a little bit more time to appreciate transit, um, being less car dependent, being less of an instant gratification society. If you're in a vehicle, slow down, yield to pedestrians and bikes. A huge piece I think is shifting work culture. So if you show up a few minutes late for a meeting because your train was late, that's okay. And maybe you telecommute from home where over the lunch hour you can run your errands on foot or by bike. In reference to equity, I think the, the biggest things are kind of the things that I touched upon. Really looking at um, how people of color and poor people could use public transportation to get access to employment and having, you know, routes that are conducive to that. We got a lot of people work overnights and or certain jobs that ain't able to work on because of the, the overnights. I think, I think they, they need some more individual bus. Um, like maybe like, you know, in the suburbs, they got the little white buses that have little showroom that could pick people up and take them to specific destinations. They should probably, you know what I'm saying, quick with them. For the eastern suburbs, western suburbs, you know, maybe looking at how do we create hubs in North Minneapolis so everyone's not going downtown to get everywhere that they need to go. Um, I think that would be helpful where people could get access to where they're looking to go without particularly going through downtown. It also needs to be affordable for people, particularly low-income people, 
who rely upon public transportation? I think looking at ways that they can structure bus passes that are maybe a slightly better deal um, to help with people who are looking for employment. Um, but honestly, I think that I think that trans, Metro Transit is doing a really good job, and I think that we just got now that they're starting to figure it out. Um, we've just got to keep it, keep it going and increase that momentum, and it's going to take funding in order to make that happen. Thank you to all of our correspondents who sent to us their thoughts on video. Um, we gave people some prompts, but they took it where they needed to take it. And I think that we could do a lot more of that as we're, as we're planning our, our transportation future. Just a, a little local aside here. Um, the Minneapolis Transportation Action Plan is still out for comment. It is incredibly forward thinking and we hope that everybody will go um, and look at it, review it, and fill it out with your comments by tomorrow, the deadline, which is Friday. So next up, I am delighted to introduce Adi Tomer. He's a fellow at the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Adi blew us away when we heard him speak in Minneapolis last year. He's led research on topics spanning trends in VMT, job access to transit, or excuse me, via transit, and international air travel. And he's got some key insights about the future of transportation. Uh, Again, as always, please be sure to type your questions in the Q&A box and hopefully Becky will be back to, to uh, pose some of those great questions. We will get to as many as we can and certainly take a look at the box for actual uh, post presentation answering. So thank you, Adi. Uh, please take it away. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for, for having me. It's good to uh, virtually be back in, uh, in the Twin Cities region. Um, uh, so um, a big thanks to Mary uh, and Becky and the whole team over there at Move Minneapolis for, for putting this on for everyone. Uh, one of the nice parts, I suppose, uh, building off of Angie's great comments before this, uh, before the sandwich and soup break, um, was how it's kind of nice to virtually connect with people, not just you know down the street per se, but actually all across the country and, and even the world, I guess. So um, nice to uh, uh, kind of I, I wish I could see all of you. I was going to say, nice to see all of you. That's what I'm used to saying in a, in a public setting like this, but, but nice to hopefully feel you. And, and I'm really interested to see folks' comments and questions. Um, again, my name is Adi Tomer. I lead infrastructure work at the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program. We are the uh, spatial people, both urban, suburban, and even a little bit of rural uh, at the Brookings Institution. And what I want to talk to you about today um, it is uh, very complimentary what other folks have talked about, and it's a real focus on how do we think about delivering the kind of goals that so many folks share in this space. So I mean that in a really kind of big tent way. Um, and in my estimation, um, our biggest challenge facing the country uh, is that, from a transportation perspective that is, is that we don't really have a way to translate outcomes into practice. And the more and more I've worked on these issues, the more and more this is all I kind of see. Uh, and it's a lack of ability to hardwire our preferences into the decisions that we see end up happening on the ground. It leads to a mix of frustrations of which these personalized videos that the Move Minneapolis team has put wonderfully together for today, that's the kind of frustrations you hear coming across a lot of those very personal stories. Um, it's the frustration many of us share when we kind of work on pen and paper, right, and, and wonder who we're kind of talking to as we scream into the wind in various ways. Um, and my hope is that there's actually a tremendous opportunity here. Um, Matt's opening presentation really spoke truth uh, about how in the past we've actually been able to execute on a different set of priorities. In fact, if we look all around us, even of this picture approaching Minneapolis via highway, um, that the world around us is shaped by a certain generation's priorities. My charge to all of you who are listening here today is that you are inherently the generation making decisions now, but you're also making the decisions for the generation to follow. So the question is, how do you figure out how to hardwire in 
your goals, your preferences at a wider scale. So what I want to talk about today is, in a sense, the structural inequalities that we are now dealing with, how they're being exacerbated during this incredibly challenging time in terms of public health and economic, um, economic growth and economic vitality, um, but also how that really does create opportunity. Uh, and we may have the unique opening here in the next, not just six months, but really upcoming years to actually adopt a 21st century model that again, hardwires our priorities. So let me start with structural inequalities. Um, there are more than I even have time to list here, which is a really sad state of affairs in the United States. Um, but these are the ones I wanna kind of focus on at least for today. Um, this is one of my favorite, even though it's a really sad and troubling story, uh, but one of my favorite slides to kind of show in presentations like this. I'm gonna take a second to talk it through because I think it's showing something very, very important, um, but it's got a lot of data built into it to get its story across. What you're looking at is how people spend their income on various built environment conditions, specifically housing and uh, infrastructure, including utilities and transportation. And it's breaking down American households by their income. So by quintiles, as economists call it, right? So what you're looking at all the way on the left, those are the lowest 20% of earning households in the country. And what you are seeing in that chart, passing above that um, kind of, not just red line at 100%, but what's really a red alert line to those of you looking at this, is that folks, are spending when you combine housing, infrastructure, and transportation more than their earnings just to physically live. So let that sink in for a second, right? 20% of households in America, both from, the, from elderly households to households with young children, many of them cannot afford food, healthcare, or other essential elements of life just by spending money on housing, transportation, and a mix of right water, electric, and broadband bills. Um, what's especially powerful about this chart too is how much those shares drop, not just by the time you get to the second quintile, and frankly, 60% of spending is too high too, but really once you see middle income America and higher, right, this is just not a challenge facing them. And we hear about this constantly. Uh, in communities in the Twin Cities, right, about housing affordability, prove that this is not just a coastal affair. But it's also, as we'll talk about more, and other folks have already mentioned, transportation is really, really expensive. And as Matt kind of already talked about, and I'll touch on more, and Michael did as well, to be clear, um, the transportation, the two big bars there, auto costs and automobile costs are far, far larger than the alternative. So again, structurally, infrastructure is unaffordable in this country. Second is that land use is structurally biased against transportation choice. Now, for folks who are listening today, I really want to emphasize the way I just said that, because hopefully if you agree with it, which you don't have to, there's some kind of uh, carrying the water you can do as an old DC term. Um, when you talk to colleagues in your neck of the woods, it's not just about promoting one transportation mode or the other, it's about choice. The American economy, and frankly, capitalism overall from a consumer perspective, is based on the idea that we should all have choice. Ideally, by having more choice, we get more net consumer benefits as people compete for our dollar. But that picture on the left, we have absolutely eliminated choice when it comes to people's calculations. You contrast that with the picture on the right, and you can just imagine a mix of different vehicles, um, personal, uh, private, micro-mobility, whatever you have in your head, to say nothing of people's two legs moving them, uh, going on in real time. Now, here's the real problem with outbuilding to choice, is in our estimation, we've de-emphasized the benefits of building neighborhoods for proximity. So what does proximity give you? Well, proximity does at least four really big things. Number one, building neighborhoods for proximity promotes industrial agglomeration, which is basically a technical way of saying that uh, firms and the workers who work at them thrive when they can collaborate with each other, when they're physically close to one another. And we can see that everything from patenting rates to higher productivity and sales. Second is that neighborhoods built for proximity 
require less infrastructure costs per capita, right? So it's less investments when you share more of that shared road space, right? Third, we can build more resilient places. Until we hear otherwise, the picture on the left we know is causing incredible environmental damage, both through land consumption, stormwater runoff, and of course, consumption of, green, um, uh, of fossil fuels that produce greenhouse gases. On the right, we can deliver much more sustainable habits. And fourth is that, and Angie kind of just kind of alluded to this with her book coming up, we can actually incentivize safer streets and healthier travel habits too. And by healthier travel habits, I mean actual more physical activity. Um, of course, it should all go without saying, that the image on the right attracts modal choice. Third, as a country, we cannot defy, deny the impacts of this land use model. So we have created kind of structural outputs that are hard to get rid of. Um, the average trip in the United States, according to the National Household Travel Survey, is 10.7 miles. Now let that sink in. I think Michael spoke well about how so many trips are short, and the NHTS actually confirms that. Yet the average trip mile is over 10, average trip is over 10 miles, right? How can these two uh, kind of share the same world? And it speaks to that land use model, locking us into a tremendous amount of long trips. Um, what are the further results of that? Well, we know, as Matt kind of spoke about at the beginning, that transportation is now the number one polluting sector in the economy. And this is what's really, really important here for folks to kind of think about. The other major sectors are actually decreasing in their net carbon emissions, at least from a greenhouse gas perspective. Transportation is rising. Uh, and to the extent where you can see a kind of green state like California, as Matt spoke about, transportation is actually 50% of their emission source. Finally, it's not just hyperbole to say that we could build safer neighborhoods via safer streets, but we haven't. We see the results. Traffic fatalities are on the rise. And even more troubling, it's the number one cause of unintended death for every age group in the United States. Now that doesn't even include the amount of physical harm that doesn't lead to death. That's all due to traffic behavior. So again, we have some deep seated impacts related to that land use model. Critically, broadband is not the equitable tool it could be and that many assume it already is. 18.1 million American households live without broadband. Now, to be clear, that's the kind of 15% uh, gray line you see to the right of it. But look, add in people who live with just cell phone service or just wireline service, which would be like your, your um, uh, probably what many of you are streaming on today, right? It could be either cable or telecom or fiber running into your homes, right? So those are complementary goods. We don't use cell phones and smartphones uh, for the same thing that we use our in-home uh, wireline connections for. So there's actually an even bigger gap of American households who do not have the full suite of broadband services. Um, now, what we know is that these impacts are much higher uh, in lower income neighborhoods, and in particular, lower income households. Um, and the adoption rates vary all across the country, but many of our most economically challenged states are also those with some of the highest rates of households living without broadband. I'm gonna get back to this in a second, but I think it, it's really good to follow Angie for all this, because she's kind of been, was just talking about some of the clear, at least professional benefits of a more digitalized world that takes advantage of it. What I'm here to tell you is we are not even close to ready for that kind of world. Third, public, or excuse me, fourth, public fiscal affairs overwhelmingly benefit road spending, but without fiscal sustainability in mind. So what you're seeing here is on the share of highway revenue that actually comes from direct vehicle sources. So think about what this is doing. At the federal and state level, it's often sending the signal that we should spend more money on roads because we're getting it from drivers. But at the locality level, right, we're actually overly subsidizing highway-like driving behavior. So we have a toxic mix here that exposes us uh, to, in many ways, the flawed kind of investments that people are demanding on a certain level. Now, outside of just kind of what you're seeing on here, I also want to talk about the resilience of, uh, of federal funding. Overall, beyond even infrastructure budgets, more and more states and localities are relying on federal money to make up a share of their overall budgets. Well, what we know is that exposes you to the whims of Washington, D.C. and Capitol Hill. I'll get back to them in a second, but I want you all to keep that in mind. It's not even on the, on the screen here right now. 
but federal fiscal affairs invading state and local fiscal affairs can have some dangerous consequences for what investments we can make in the future. So add this all up, there's a tremendous amount of structural inequalities that we can see through the built environment today, both how people use it, where people live, and how we have public fiscal resources to invest in it. But all of this has been heightened during this incredibly calamitous time. So Michael actually already kind of showed this data um, in one way. I want to kind of show it again. These are Google mobility reports uh, with regards to the trip purpose. So this kind of sets a general baseline of what folks are doing and not doing. I don't want to spend too much time talking about this since Michael did, but I just want to stress, right? Uh, people's um, probably nervousness to, to use transit, it's very clear here, right? People's willingness to not go into the office or frankly, the offices are closed, we can also see it. Um, fear of going to certain retail activities, also really clear. But grocery and pharmacy doing, uh, doing relatively well, and that's even with smaller total trips, but we know aggregate sales are up. Um, trips to other people's houses are up, although that's a lot of walking in a circle. <laughs> uh, and of course, trips to recreation are up too. Um, but this is very much a snapshot of what's happening in this kind of really unique phase that we're in right now. And I don't think anyone projects it to last forever. And again, when we work in infrastructure and land use, we think in multi-decade time frames. So from an infrastructure perspective, this will be a relative blip. But it is showing us a different physical reality. From one perspective, it shows that the economy can continue to a certain level without as much driving. This is some data we put together uh, at the Brookings Institution and our team. Uh, we'll be actually updating it uh, with the kind of uh, changes in driving behavior since the stay-at-home orders have been lifted to a degree. But take a look at this map really quick. First of all, you can see some interesting patterns that uh, relate to the 2016 political map, both at the state level, but also due to our own modeling, confirm that they actually go down all the way to the county level in terms of um, uh, voting behavior between Secretary Clinton and now Trump, uh, President Trump. Um, so there is an element of politics to this, but there's also an element of what work people do. So one of the most significant effects we could see in a model we ran was actually the share of workers in advanced services and heavy scientific activities. Those are the workers who are able to stay home. Frankly, it's me and it's probably many of you listening today. That means again, that not only do we have ample broadband connections, but we also work for an employer who's allowing us to stay at home. The question is, how does this change as these works, uh, as the stay-at-home orders are lifted. Um, what, one of the things we're kind of concerned about here is, um, is what it means for capital budgets with regards to less gas tax revenue coming in and all the various investments that those revenues end up uh, paying for. What we also know though too, is that broadband, in particular the digital divide, which is the idea, right, of who does and does not have connections to high-speed internet, is only getting worse. And it, the only silver line here is that be, due to the telecommuting nature of so much work, the shift to e-commerce, this has really shown a spotlight that uh, folks in the field have been looking to get more attention on for honestly over two decades now. Um, so this is a map of metropolitan Minneapolis, St. Paul. First of all, it's huge. So you can see how large the neighborhoods are. These are census tracts on the borders of the counties. But as you kind of, if you can, look closer towards the core, you can see higher rates of, um, of disconnect in many places. In many ways, this reflects neighborhoods where folks either do not have the option to connect at home or less likely to be connecting. So they cannot benefit from this transition um, to a kind of digital world, right? So this is what I want to kind of pose to you all. What, what happens when we start to open up? Well, the concern for me is really the two biggest ones is around who's lost employment and how well can people travel if they have it? Well, here's what we know. For the nearly 40 million workers who've been laid off, we've set up a pernicious transportation cycle. If people lose their jobs, how do they afford their cars? But if they can't afford their cars, how do we expect them to get to job interviews? Or even if the job interview can be done virtually, how can they get to the job site for the new job they've acquired? Again, due to spatial mismatch and intense um, an intense kind of land consumption on the, on the metropolitan periphery, more and more people and jobs are spreading further apart from each other. And it's really expensive to own a car. We also know that in particular that many people have, uh, have auto loans um, to afford their personal transportation. Well, if they lose their jobs, how can they make payments on their cars? 
they will immediately lose that vehicle, which will only exacerbate their inability to get to um, employment. I want to kind of note one final element. Um, you've been kind of hearing me talk a little bit about race and parts. This is another area where we expect enormous structural barriers to show themselves in different ways based on specific demographic communities, not just by race and ethnicity, but absolutely inclusive of it. Uh, so this is an area for folks to really, really keep their eyes on. The other side here is frontline workers who can't telecommute. Well, I would say that many of these are going to be prone to the extreme fiscal insecurity that are now facing our transit agencies. So what we've seen now is a kind of intertwining of those who are working, often for relatively lower wages. And again, just to be clear, by our calculations, which our team also runs at Brookings Metro, uh, there are 50 million frontline workers in America. Those are people who cannot telecommute but are counted as essential workers. So these are people going into work. They are already an outside share of transit riders. But here's the problem, right? We know that transit is really struggling. They've got in a really important lifeline from, uh, from the federal government in terms of a $15 billion set of operating support, but that can't last forever. And how can we make sure that we continue to run enough buses, not just to get people to all those other activities besides work, but that most important of trip for most uh, households each day is getting to work. What do we do if people cannot get to their jobs anymore? And they're, they are not transit choice riders, they are transit dependent riders. This is to me of deep, deep concern. And we're going to only, we're going to have to wait a little bit to see national results, but my gut is that this is not going to play out well for regional economies, but most importantly, some of our most disadvantaged communities. Finally, I kind of talked about reliance on fiscal affairs from Washington. Well, here's the problem, right? Do you, any of you have full confidence that Congress will form the backstop to what we need as a country to make critical investments, everything from continuing unemployment insurance to sending more than the initial $150 billion to state and local budgets to, of course, like I just mentioned, maintaining that lifeline for vital transit operating support. I work in Washington. Uh, I don't have full confidence that we're going to see this, um, uh, these kind of continuity of benefits or even increase in them continue. Um, and quite frankly, if it does, I'm worried that it's going to take up until the last minute. Right, which is going to cause an undue amount of stress, not on the onlookers, but the people who are reliant on that, that spending in the future. So um, for folks wondering, what, what happens if the support doesn't come through? Well, we already know. It doesn't matter how much support Washington has. State and local governments are already under fiscal threat. And the first cuts you can expect to see, as my great colleague Mike Pagano at the University of Illinois Chicago talks about, is going to be in capital budgets, specifically in infrastructure related capital budgets. So if you're wondering if your potholes are gonna get filled, if even they're gonna be less likely to buy new bus equipment, the answer is yes. Uh, there's going to be real challenges and we see that in every kind of recession and it looks like we're unfortunately heading for a longer sustained recession uh, due to the coronavirus. So what does this all mean? Well, we have, these structural barriers are showing themselves in some nasty, nasty ways right now. Um, we can't feel good that the support will come to fix our most pressing infrastructure needs. Um, we can't feel good that state and local support will last, but we also can't feel good that capital budgets as they're getting slashed will go towards the most necessary projects. And, and finally, um, how are we gonna make sure that the investments we do make, the programming and operations decisions we do make, that they're to the benefit of all workers and all people? So to me, this is where trying to be an optimist uh, it points to me towards a, the time for a new model. So what do I mean by that? Well, too much of what we kind of deal with now is based on outdated considerations. Think, most of our policy on the books from the federal down to the local level was built on a 20th century model. What was that built on? Well, Matt already kind of talked about at the beginning, but even taking out some of the really, really nasty uh, racial elements under, under, uh, undergirding it, there was also a kind of more engineering driven thought around physical connectivity, especially by roads. So that was between municipalities, right? So your classic city to suburb connections. It was also between metropolitan areas, most evident by the national highway system. Well, that kind of physical connectivity, especially by road, we have more than accomplished that mission. We live in a different time where um, inequality, especially in terms of income, but also by wealth, um, is skyrocketing, highest rates since the Gilded Age at the turn of the 19th to the 20th centuries. We know that we also 
have a much more competitive global economy. And firms of all sizes, but especially startups, have a, have a tough time attracting talent, retaining it, and, and the ability to sell their goods um, and compete for talent. Uh, finally, we know that the most pressing existential threat we have is, uh, is, is global climate change. And we don't nearly have enough uh, programs on the books to hit the targets we all share. So it's time to adopt a model that does something different. Well, what could that look like? Fortunately, we have seen a great merging over the past few years between the transportation and land use community and the economic development community uh, in metropolitan areas across the country. And their work tends to fall into the kind of these three buckets. They wanna promote business, which is frankly more traditional. They wanna make sure they promote the growth of all people, which is new. And in particular, they wanna think about it in a place-based lens. You can see these plans all over the place. And that's a really positive development. These are kind of like the grass shoots that we've been waiting for. Um, so what could some of those policies be? Well, you know, what's gonna happen with single family housing, right? This is obviously a well-told story in the city of Minneapolis now, but it's happening in other, country, other cities across the country too. How can we form other elements of zoning to make sure that we can have a more inclusive set of land uses and a connectivity between neighborhoods? How do we reconsider exactly what are we subsidizing? Subsidies are a big part of what we do as a community. In fact, it's just, <laughs> subsidy sounds like a four letter word. It's just what we've all decided to spend money on together. But right now our subsidies don't necessarily reflect our shared values. So how can we reconsider them for a different kind of future? And then from the transportation perspective, um, and this is basically my last slide, I wanna kind of leave you with this, um, this idea and I'll give you an example of it in a second. We on the transportation community know so much about the kind of investments we wanna make. In fact, it's not even hard to imagine our future as, as Michael's excellent slide show. We have, tend to have mock-ups of pictures all across the world um, some real, some fictitious of the, of the physical world we want to see. But too often when we do that, we forget the political economy of achieving that vision. So what's it going to take to get to that place? We're going to need to convince folks of the importance of pricing. And frankly, my, my colleague, uh, colleagues over at the Eno Transportation Center just put out a really important port, report just this morning on um, different tactics around congestion pricing. Second, we're going to have to get serious about regionalism. Too much parochialism, in particular drawn by municipal boundaries, has led to bad outcomes in the country. We do not have regional actors with enough teeth. And finally, we need to figure out ways to break through the national politics. That, you know, inner city connections, whether by road or air, right, um, that's not the priority in the country anymore. We need to heal ourselves locally. And what we want is a real supporting actor coming out of Washington. So I'm confident we can get there. One final example here is this tool that we developed with Portland, which we're getting set to launch. Uh, I'm saying this somewhat quietly, knowing this is public, <laughs> uh, both in the Twin Cities and in metropolitan Kansas City, that we call an economic value atlas. But what's the idea here is that if you can see on the left, is actually putting these values into place, showing built environment professionals how the economy works at a local level, and then allowing us to have a reframing of conversations of, um, of how we build uh, physical places that actually deliver the economic, social, and environmental outcomes we all care about. Thank you all for listening. I hope there was no technical difficulties and, and, and blips along the way, and I look forward to answering any questions that I can. Great. Thanks so much, Adi. So we're going to get right into uh, some rapid fire uh, Q&A uh, before we hear from um, some more community voices. Uh, from Minneapolis. So we have a question. Um, how do we address equity of access to the resources that allow for telecommuting? And I'm glad you talked a little bit about it. And uh, the question really, you know, uh, this particular question says, um, you know, does that fall on the responsibility of employers, on, on regulators? Um, what do you think? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, Angie's speech was great. Uh, there's been a big push in translation demand circles, as probably many folks are um, watching right now are probably participants in themselves, um, about making sure employers have more flexible policies. You know, that's, that's kind of the gold standard. And frankly, if we can get that um, and managers actually follow through with it, which has to do with human resource policy that I don't understand, <laughs> then, uh, then I think we'll be in a good shape. Um, what's really challenging us as a country right now, we've been studying broadband for about four or five years pretty diligently, um, is that uh, we do not have affordable broadband at the neighborhood level. Uh, digital redlining is real. 
there is a lack of, in particular, wireline investments in specific communities. So many neighborhoods you might think are connected right down the street from you, and potentially. They actually don't have the options many of us on this, on this uh, digital webinar have. Um, and finally, we need to be more serious about getting resources out to, uh, to families in particular with school-aged children uh, to make sure that they can always have a connection at home um, that is not data limited or data capped. Uh, and that they also have a device they can use, right? That's not just a smartphone without a physical keyboard on it. Um, if we can hit all those notes, we can make sure that, that folks have a platform to opportunity in the future. But in particular, when it comes to affordability, that everyone has, from a transportation perspective, a smartphone that they can use for digital routing and other kind of innovative transportation um, uh, options, they can actually tap into them and use them more. Absolutely. Have you heard of any state, local, or, um, or the... Or federal government using incentives to encourage more broad scale telework, um, in particular tax incentives like we do with parking or transit passes? Yeah, um, there is some. Um, you know, in fact, even in the greater Washington DC region, there's been some pretty active work there. Um, but again, I, I don't want to be a, too Pollyanna about this, but, um, you know, it doesn't take much reading of, let's say, the Wall Street Journal right now to see that, like, um, quote unquote, like the titans of industry in America, they've gotten the memo on telecommuting now. Um, and the fears were so much about management as, as they were pretty public about. Um, so I'm actually really confident, I could be wrong, but that um, we're gonna see much more liberal telecommuting be, um, practices. Um, and what's gonna be really interesting to watch from a transportation perspective and an equity perspective is, is who, who taps into those? Um, which industries do they spread to? Which workers benefit from it? Um, and then what happens when we kind of take those travelers off the roads, how are we able to use that as an opportunity to change up the kind of infrastructure we've already built to hopefully be built for more sustainable uses too? That's great. Okay, I've got one last question for you. And then I would um, encourage you to, if you could stick around, uh, go ahead and answer questions live in the um, Q&A. So here's my last live question for you. Um, how do we separate car ownership from the notion of autonomy? And further, you know, freedom in a social and political sense. So, you know, we're, we're here in the US, we're constantly dealing with politics of public transit is kind of not in step with our individualist um, modes of consumption and living. And do you have any actionable steps that we can take to deconstruct these powerful narratives? Yeah, um, this one's really hard. Uh, I wish you wouldn't have asked it. Uh, so I could have just gotten out of here. Um, this, um, you know, let me answer it in this way. And I actually find this to be positive in tone, but some folks might find this exhausting. Um, you need to be really, really patient. Um, infrastructure and land use, it's not like other levers we have, right? They last for a generation. As folks, even in the Twin Cities know about the time, you've had some great videos folks talking about, I wish we get light rail faster, yet the folks on the inside know how hard it is to even get right. those projects underground. And frankly, even for folks who don't like highways, they actually take a while to plan too. You know, these are, these are long run, you're kind of working in a long run sector here, right? So we have built communities uh, for a reality that right, restricts transportation choice. We cannot just undo it. Um, it won't be that simple. So what I think is some of the best ways to do this is to give people examples of alternatives, right? Alternatives where they have choice. To talk more to people in your community about the benefits, it was great to see, I think it was either the Minneapolis or St. Paul uh, um, uh, representative talking about um, how she gave up her car and how freeing that was, right? You know, more stories like that, you know, we're gonna move people unfortunately slowly on this, um, but ideally we'll all be able to look back in a few decades um, as crazy as that means, I don't know how long that is. <laughs> Look back and say, wow, you know what? We actually really started something different. We actually started building our communities in different ways. And to give people a really optimistic tone on how this looks, anyone who spent time in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s and 1990s, it's not the Washington, D.C. you know today. That was only 20 years ago, right? So change really can happen. And many of our communities, Minneapolis and St. Paul included, have amazing urban bones to work with. Let's just figure out ways to activate growth in the places where we know it can deliver that kind of change and, and change people's minds. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna pop over into a community um, video uh, of community voices here right now. And 
uh, and then back to Mary in just a couple minutes. All right, that was great. We, we've had a slight change in uh, what plans. I, was, I guess not, here we go. What I would like transportation to look like in 10 years is to be inclusive for all. And when I say that, I mean, most people think of transportation, they think of just cars and buses and sometimes even airplanes. I want it to be more inclusive for our walkers, our bikers, those those are forms of transportation as well. In 10 years, I would like my commute to look like um, my car stays in my garage unless I am doing something where driving is absolutely required. I would like for to pretty much be able to be automobilist, um, but then have the assets that I needed within my community. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Just being able to have a community where you could walk the things and bike the things and convenient and then kind of have that be a understood kind of a subculture around transportation. In 10 years, I'd like to be able to go out the house and go down to a train station, grab a train, um, have the bus network be really super um, responsive to the, that train schedule and so that there's an inner network of, of multifaceted transport um, that you can have enough room for bikes on the trains, enough room for bikes on the buses, and that they go through the night because people work nights. Let's face it. One big thing I'd love to see in 10 years is for us to have developed a much stronger culture of walking. Uh, my hope is that with uh, more of the missing teeth filled in, um, fewer surface parking lots, um, more density in our in our downtown core, that uh, walking will be a more pleasant experience and it'll be a lot more normal for people to choose to walk as a mode of transportation. Trams, light rail, trains serving major and busy areas, then buses serving the, the rest. I dream of being able to visit my hometown of Marine on St. Croix via train. That would be amazing. I dream of not owning a car and not contributing to global warming and not paying auto insurance. That would also be incredible. I dream of biking year round and just feeling safe and, and not judged. Uh, fast, frequent transit. Um, and I'd also like to see abundant, secure bike parking. For everybody. I want everyone to be able to get to where they're going safely using whatever mode method that they choose and that it's enjoyable for all. In 10 years I hope that our transportation system looks like second nature that my son who is seven now will just think of public transportation and our transportation system as something that is easy to access, is the first thing that he thinks of when he wants to get somewhere, and is just something that has become so second nature that it is built into every time we need to get somewhere. I think that we should continue to invest in walking, biking, and transit, and the sharing economy so that in 10 years, all people of all ages and all abilities will have the option to get to where they want to go without using a private car. In 10 years, I'd like more bike trails and clean electric buses. That was so charming. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I am so happy you're here. We're, we're down to the last third of our event, and it's been just mind-blowing to me. And I hope that you have enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, Today and right now, I'm so pleased to welcome Jared Johnson. Um, he's director and the first ever Chief Operating Officer of Transit Matters in Boston. Jared comes with expertise in community and political organizing with a side of managing 
complex affordable residential housing development projects. You might as well throw that in too. <laughs> uh, and best of all, in my book, you live car free. Um, and, and that takes commitment and it, it is not lost on any of us. So um, friends, as usual, type your questions in the Q&A. And thank you so much for joining us. Jared, take it away. Great. Thank you, Mary. All right. Well, first off, I want to say thank you to the, uh, to the team at Move Minneapolis for inviting me. Uh, Mary, Becky, Alex, and the whole team there, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited that you all are hosting this, um, you know, fantastic event, uh, even in spite of COVID. Uh, you know, the issues of mobility, climate change and equity don't go away uh, just because we're in a, uh, a pandemic effect. I think they're only magnified. So uh, now I'm going to uh, talk about how cities and agencies can move forward in this unsure world. Um, so again, I'm Jared Johnson. Uh, I've been in this role for a little over a year now. So, uh, you know, with uh, this pandemic, talk about uh, going out of the fire and into the frying pan. Um, so a little bit about Transit Matters. Transit Matters works in and around Greater Boston to make public transportation better by bringing world best practice, technical advocacy, uh, and sound uh, transportation policy. Uh, but so we can get to the meat of the presentation, let's just say we're people focused uh, and data driven. So to get a good handle on this, I think it's important to revisit the problem. Uh, I think we all know that ridership has dropped, uh, but seeing it in graphs is pretty stark. Um, as early as March 22nd, you can see a pretty precipitous drop worldwide um, using uh, data from the Movement app. Uh, and in Boston, by March 26th, the ridership had reached just about its lowest point. Um, so about 22% for buses and somewhere between zero and 5% for, uh, for commuter rail. Uh, and in Minneapolis, uh, there you all have seen similar results. Uh, buses are down by about 60 to 70 percent, and the suburban express buses and light rail are down by 90 plus percent. Uh, and also, what's important to note is that the uh, the times and the way people uh, have traveled traveled has changed. Uh, the ridership has shifted from you know really massive spikes and really low lows to a pattern with you know obviously smaller peaks, but a larger percentage, a larger proportion of off-peak riders. Um, and it's also interesting, interesting that the times have shifted. You know, the new peaks are at six to seven in the morning and three to four in the afternoon instead of at eight and at five. Uh, and I also think it's important to look at the, the sort of the reality that we live in. Um, you know, perception is reality. So let's take a look at how folks are perceiving transit. So this is a study, uh, a couple of studies done um, in Boston and uh, it was at the beginning of this month and it showed that only about 18% of people uh, we're ready to get back on the system. And you know, this number inches up during later stages of the recovery as treatment becomes available and as a vaccine becomes available, but it's still pretty scary. Uh, and then a national study found that, uh, found similar numbers uh, with 20% of transit riders saying that they wouldn't return and a further 28% saying that they would ride transit less. And it's understandable, but you know, the numbers are much higher than seemingly riskier options like shopping or um, or dining in at rest, dining out at restaurants. Um, and it's also worth noting that uh, if these folks were switching to uh, bikes or walking, it wouldn't be as much of a concern, but you know, we know in most cities that's not the case. Um, there's also been some pseudoscience at play. Uh, a study from MIT in my own backyard uh, asserted that the uh, New York City subway was a leading vector in spreading COVID. Um, you know, thankfully that study has been widely panned as you know, not being thoroughly researched and it isn't even peer, re peer reviewed, but it's the world that we live in. You know, but to, to paraphrase uh, Mark Twain, you know, um, you know, reports of transit, you know, going away or no one ever riding transit again are greatly exaggerated. You know, people will still need uh, to use public transportation. Folks are still using it now, especially our essential workers, uh, but we are gonna have to adjust. I think it's also helpful to look at some examples, mostly positive examples of how agencies uh, across the country and across the world are responding. Uh, the director of San Francisco Muni has been getting a lot of praise for his candid interviews where he talks about reorienting the agency to embrace radical resiliency. Uh, one example of that is going to 100% uh, bus operations. That meant shuttering the beloved cable cars and the light rail, but this allowed them to have more flexibility uh, a system that was easier to operate and was better scaled for ridership. They've also moved away from a set schedule 
and are instead moving to managing headways. This means um, managing the time between buses. And they actually believe that they're going to keep on doing this after COVID, um, that this is just you know, better for folks than having to memorize a schedule. Uh, and they've also added better than pre-COVID service on some corridors uh, and increased their night bus service and adding more capacity to that. Uh, the CTA in Chicago decided not to cut service. They argued that as an essential service, uh, they needed to be there for riders and that the most efficient way to ensure that they had physical distancing was to run normal frequent service. Uh, in Pittsburgh, the Port Authority is really taking a proactive approach. Uh, they have buses in reserve during heavy ridership periods, and then this allows them to bring buses into service quickly if one of them is reaching the new COVID limit. Uh, and they have already returned to a normal schedule uh, in order to enable more frequency. Uh, internationally, Hong Kong is, de is deploying thermal scanners, scanners at, at key stations to take temperatures. Wuhan, they have a, an airport style um, airport style equipment that's able to scan large numbers of people at once. Uh, and something that we're unlikely to see here, um, they have QR code scanners that track riders as they're um, going on the different modes of the system so that if they test positive later, uh, the authorities can uh, better trace. And it's also uh, there to prevent those who've been ordered to quarantine from traveling. And Madrid has enlisted transit police to help hand out face masks so that they can uh, ensure that they're able to enforce that face mask order. So now let's take a look at what cities, municipalities, and local governments can do. You know, we're used to sites like this, soul crushing, mind numbing traffic. Uh, well, now our highways look like this. And our arterials look like this. Um, but, you know, they, you know, one of the things that is, that's changing is now cities and agencies have data on which routes are performing comparatively well even in the midst of, of this pandemic. So that means it's time to reallocate street space. Um, let's return the street space to the folks that we're calling heroes. And let's get creative about what a bus lane can look like. Let's support small businesses by giving them more space for outdoor dining or shopping. You know, of course, Minneapolis is no stranger to uh, open streets. You know, they're one of the pioneers, uh, the Nicolette Mall. But we have to make sure that we're, uh, that we don't just open streets in downtowns and wealthier neighborhoods. You know, places like Southside Minneapolis need open streets too. And we need to rethink what our streets are for. Um, and not just for physical distancing, not just for this phase, but for the foreseeable future. You know, we need to turn over streets for essential workers to bike commute uh, and for uh, physical distancing during recreation even if those things don't add to transit ridership. Uh, and as ridership uh, returns to transit, some of those newly open streets can transform into busways. You know, these are new spaces that can give us freedom, the freedom to cycle safely, to walk without worry, and to have bus riders bypass traffic. It's also time to show the bus some love. You know, one of the things that's been clear is that, you know, these changes have to happen really quickly. And packed libraries or school gyms for public meetings are quite a ways off. Uh, but Boston has actually led the way in temporary bus lane pilots. Uh, they did five of them, um, you know, over the last uh, two years or so, and all of them have become permanent in some way, um, some way, shape, or form. Uh, but one thing that's really important to note is that the pilot is the process. You know, instead of a instead of a lot of back and forth in most cases, um, during these pilots, the direct abutters and businesses were engaged, and then the pilot just rolled out, and then they were able to collect feedback during that. Um, and it was really successful in every case in Boston. You know, even the drivers acknowledged that there was no meaningful change uh, in their commutes, but for the bus riders, uh, they saved valuable minutes and had a much more reliable commute time. Um, so again, it's really about honoring the essential workers that are keeping us alive, uh, keeping us fed and keeping our economy going. Uh, cities need to use care, CARES funding uh, and hopefully, you know, upcoming stimulus funding to design, accelerate, and construct you know, relatively small but transformative projects like bus bulb outs that prevent buses from getting stuck at the curb and make boarding easier uh, for those with disabilities. Things like traffic signal priority, queue jumps, and permanent bus lanes should be implemented um, wherever possible or fast-tracked. We also need to give bus riders dignity while they wait for the bus. And another point is that messaging is key. You know, we need public officials to remind people that just because there's you know, fewer cars on the road, uh, Central Avenue is not a drag strip. Uh, the fatality rate in Massachusetts doubled last month 
uh, despite traffic dropping by 50%. And then we also have to watch our language uh, about how we talk about staying home. Um, cities shouldn't be dis discouraging people from using um, transit. You know, uh, we need to use a better language. People don't always intuitively get the, for the duration of the surge part. Um, so we need to use language like leave room for essential workers and only use transit for essential trips. Uh, we shouldn't be, um, you know, using message that transit is unsafe uh, or even saying things that might, uh, people that might intuit that transit is unsafe because if transit is unsafe, you should probably shut your city down because uh, the grocery store workers, healthcare workers, and the other essential workers that we depend on, they use transit. So we need to make sure that we're not sending mixed signals. And as a lot of other folks have talked about, um, you know, part of how we get to a better transportation system, um, you know, is more than just uh, the buses and trains. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's other things. It's, it's um, you know, and these are things that might not add ridership, you know, telecommuting, um, you know, that we talked about earlier is one of them. You know, we know that not everyone lives uh, within a reasonable distance of transit uh, or can bike or walk to work. So municipalities should be encouraging uh, those who, who can work from home to do so, you know, because every person who's working from home uh, removes a car from the path of those essential workers. We also have to talk about uh, land use uh, going forward. You know, we've already had this conversation in, in a couple of, of the presentations earlier. Uh, every neighborhood, no matter the scale, single family or high rise, uh, should allow residents to get their essential errands in a 15 to 20 minute radius, you know, by foot or by bike. Uh, Paris Mayor Anne Hidalgo has really recently been championing this. Uh, we really need to reorient our neighborhood so that folks can access childcare, cultural activities, parks, healthcare, food, uh, and so much more in a walkable human scale community. Uh, and again, this might mean that you don't need Metro Transit uh, or the T for your errands, but it increases quality of life and cuts down on air pollution. Also, you know, local governments need to make sure that they're, um, you know, using the data that they're collecting from this to build a more resilient community. Uh, they should be identifying the corridors that have significant numbers of bus riders, bike commuters, and pedestrians. And in future emergencies, uh, these should serve as recovery corridors uh, that get priority for cleanup and have space allocated for cycling, walking, or buses in order to facilitate uh, you know, the community moving around. So what are some things that agencies can do? One of the most important things is spread the peak. Uh, you know, a new travel pattern demands a new service pattern. Transit, regardless of the mode, shouldn't have gaps of 40 minutes or more during the midday, and they should expand the period of increased service. As we talked about, you know, these peaks are, you know, in the, in, you know, in, before COVID, you know, these peaks, the, the peak of the peak um, was about 15 minutes or so. Now, um, these, these new peaks are, are a bit longer. Boston has already started re some of this rejiggering of service. You know, after moving to a Saturday schedule because of the lower ridership, uh, they adjusted the number of bus routes uh, and even two subway lines to respond to uh, rider complaints about crowding. Uh, the T also added earlier trains to respond to demand for healthcare workers. A Saturday schedules uh, had no uh, no service that got people into Boston by 7 uh, a.m. on the commuter rail. And last time I checked, uh, hospitals and other businesses still function in the early hours on the weekend. And so, you know, while we're grateful that the T has been really responsive, uh, we really want agencies to become proactive and really address crowding before it becomes an issue. Uh, agencies also need to make sure that they're protecting the frontline transit workers. Most transit agencies have moved to rear door boarding uh, to protect bus drivers. Uh, and some have even blocked off the entire front section of the bus. You know, and this makes sense for earlier phases, but as ridership grows um, and as the risk decreases, we need to adapt. Transit agencies need to install protective screens for drivers. Uh, these are more secure and protect the driver from assaults as well as COVID. Uh, and it also enables another that helps transit. It enables all door boarding. Uh, this decreases crowding near the rear door uh, so, you know, riders will spread out throughout the bus if they know they can exit through either door. And it also speeds up the bus. This is from a pilot done in Boston. And as you can see, after, you know, 11 minutes uh, with all door boarding, you know, that bus is probably going to take off in a few seconds versus the long line of folks still queuing up at the front. Um, you know, this means that the buses can get through their route faster. So this means more frequent buses and less crowding. Uh, you know, and as we mentioned earlier, um, you know, Perception is reality. Uh, and many of the reasons that people are afraid to ride transit stem from uh, the situation pre-COVID. You know, many agencies were starved of funding and some of them lost rider trust. And so in order to counter this narrative, agencies need to be almost performative 
uh, in gaining the trust back. You know, they need to be very visible about cleaning, very radically uh, transparent about uh, their plans to adapt. You know, dark, dirty, grimy trains and stations they have to be a thing of the past. You know, they erode trust and contribute to an overall negative feeling about transit. You know, this station is grungy, um, you know, but not actually that dirty. There's not a whole lot of things on the floor, you know, and being, you know, poorly lit and rusty is no indicator of COVID, but it certainly doesn't help uh, public perception. You know, we should look to the pride that uh, Japan, Korea, um, that they take in their stations. This is the kind of work that it's going to take to bring people back to transit. Um, you know, and we know that it works uh, because, you know, many modern pandemics obstruct Asian cities and uh, in almost all the cases, transit ridership has rebounded and even grows. Agencies need to be constantly assessing the demand and be ready to increase service uh, on the routes that are most used by essential workers so that they can prevent crowding. More service means that people don't have to choose between getting on a crowded bus or being late for work. You know, we have to do better uh, for these riders. And you know, why does this matter? This matters because studies in Asia show that reducing crowding, getting to near universal usage of face masks means that transit is no riskier um, than any other activity. You know, if we, if we also sp spread the peak and speed up transit, those all contribute uh, to making transit even safer. So going forward, um, I think we have to remember a few things. The status quo was inequitable. You know, the status quo was harming environmental justice communities and falling short of the radical action that we need to take in order to save our planet. From crowded buses, to poor air quality, to infrequent transit, to time wasted in traffic. You know, we have to imagine a better world and not just simply, you know, recreate, um, you know, the injustices that COVID has led bare. So, you know, let's imagine a better world for our kids with zero traffic fatalities where life expectancy and health aren't determined by your zip code or by transit access, where mobility is broader than a personal vehicle uh, and where we can breathe easier and where transit, even the bus, uh, which we usually relegate to last place, offers a dignified world-class experience that, um, that connects people to opportunity. So thank you. It's it's really been an honor to talk about these issues with you. I know we've just barely scratched the surface, but hopefully I've given you some good food for thought. Uh, again, I'm yes. Jared from Boston. You can find me on Twitter. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you so much, Jared. We have time for um, a little bit of Q&A and we've got some questions coming in. I've got one for you right off the bat. Um, you mentioned a number of different cities that are changing right at the beginning of your presentation yep. that are um, changing their transit service in response to COVID-19. Um, you know, some are reducing service, some are making um, different types of service changes. Um, but some, like you, San Francisco, are using it to better serve essential workers, prime transit customers. And, you know, for us here in Minneapolis, what is your suggestion for next steps that our our Minneapolis St. Paul regional transit system should take? I think the first thing is you've got to understand, you know, who's using the system, what neighborhoods are coming from. Um, and I think that's, that's gotta be the, the base of it. You know, you've really got to reorient it towards, um, you know, towards your core ridership. And so, you know, that might mean, you know, you know, that might mean that, you know, you're reallocating buses, um, you know, from, uh, you know, from a, a place where there's just not that, that, you know, just extremely low, uh, ridership and, and making sure that you've got uh, enough buses so that you're not having crowding uh, on those on those lines. And then I think it's about, um, you know, asking those riders, you know, what, you know, what do they need? And again, I think it's one of the things that we're, you know, that we're, we're excited about that's happened at Boston is, you know, normally transit planning um, and service planning is this long process and it's, it's you know, six months or, or more or so to change uh, change a bus route or to really do substantive uh, service changes. But in Boston, you know, when they get reports of crowding, they are, you know, changing things either later that day or the next day. And so I really think we should be, I think, you know, no matter your system, no matter the size of it, we should be moving to a system that is much more flexible and able to respond to, um, to, to the demands uh, and respond to crowding, even when it's no longer um, such a, you know, a, a high health issue, um, you know, crowded buses and, and crowded trains are not, you know, they're not comfortable, even if they're not, um, you know, potentially harmful. And so right. really, really looking at that. 
Great, great, thanks. Um, we have a couple questions about um, uh, open streets in response to COVID-19. And I've got you know, a couple questions here. And I, I, thanks for the Nicollet Mall example. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I, I think, uh, so let's see, the question is, how do we ensure COVID open streets um, don't only benefit wealthier communities that, that use them for recreation? And how, how, do, you, how do you feel about that? Is, how yeah, do we get no. started? Where do we start? <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's tougher now because now we're sort of in this loosening up, you know, phase, but, um, you know, I think you, you've got to start with, you know, what's the most, most important thing and open streets absolutely support them, but, you know, it's far more important that, um, you know, that, that, you know, bike commuters, you know, in a lower neighborhood, you know, are, are able to get to work safely that, you know, folks who are going to, you know, the bodegas and low income neighborhoods that, that, that sidewalk isn't super crowded. And so I think that's what you have to start with. Um, and I think you, you have to, you know, one of the things that, that is, um, that I think, it, you know, has to happen is you've got to have it from a, from a, a, a um, from a citywide sort of perspective. I think one thing that, that can lead to that sort of, you know, can lead to um, just the wealthier neighborhoods getting, um, you know, being the only ones that benefit is when you just listen to, you know, the squeaky wheel, um, you know, in a lot of EJ communities, you know, they're dealing with a lot of stuff. And so they're not the ones on Twitter, you know, tweeting angrily, why won't you open up such and such drive? Um, and so I think you need to have a plan where you're saying, okay, how do we build? And also connectivity, you know, these shouldn't just be open streets just for the sake of open streets. Um, you know, I think, you know, primarily your goal should be setting up a, a network. And so I think that's another way that you make sure that you're not just benefiting um, you know, specific communities that you're designing a network that can connect people to the hospitals, connect people to, um, you know, the main business districts uh, and connect people to, to transit hubs. Great. Thanks. I'm taking a look at the time and I, I think we better um, uh, move, keep moving. Um, thank you so much, Jared. And uh, no please feel free to keep uh, answering. We've got lots of open questions in the <laughs> Q&A. Thanks to everybody who's putting them in there. Of course, um, thank you. Thank you. Jared, that was wonderful. Thanks for stopping in from Boston. So um, we're gonna zip, zip across the country for our last speaker. Um, and I can say this because we're in Minneapolis. I can say coming from sunny Los Angeles, our final speaker today is Alyssa Walker. Uh, as the urbanism editor at Curb, she authors the column Word on the Street which highlights the pioneering transit, clever civic design, and game-changing policy affecting our cities. Alyssa is a co-host of LA Podcast and a contributor to the KCRW show, Greater LA. And if you haven't read her post to Curbed from yesterday, I recommend you do so. I, I believe I tweeted out the word devastating. Um, it's brilliant, and I hope that you will speak to some of that today. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you, Mary. Can you hear me okay? Do you have a thumbs up from anybody? I assume it's good. Okay. Um, it's so weird to talk to a screen of, of nothing, but it's very good to see all of you here. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, All right, so um, my, my part is just going to be uh, kind of like a way to wrap up, I think some of the things we've talked about today and just leave us with some parting thoughts. And so I wanted to talk about, you know, what happens when we get moving again? What are, what are some of the moments that we want to experience when we are going back out in the world and we are going back to our jobs and, and going back to our, our lives outside of our homes. And uh, these are my two kids who are, I think, very anxious to get back to that life, um, uh, but really have enjoyed also this time of being at home and, and, uh, and tootling around the neighborhood. So um, 
I wanted to first just start by um, saying that I have some great Minneapolis ties. Um, and I, I am such a fan of the, of the city. This is my grandmother, the, the tiny uh, person scowling to the far left over here. Um, they grew up in St. Paul. This is her house that I rode your bike share to the last time I was there, the house she grew up in. She doesn't live there anymore. She's actually passed away. Uh, but that I think that there's something very, um, there's a spirit that she had from, from growing up there that I hope she shared with me and that, that I see in the way that you have tackled a lot of these issues around land use and transportation. And we're, of course, very big fans of something that you managed to do that here in California, we haven't quite managed to do, even though we've tried a few times. Um, and I think that uh, just looking at to you as an example is something that I, I want to speak to um, today as well, because I think you have you hold a lot of the keys to um, what we're looking for in this post coronavirus uh, world. So I just want to highlight just three quick little you know, topics that we're going to go over and then I have a bonus one at the end. So things we're going to talk about are, you know, when we get moving in, how to stay healthy, how to protect essential workers, and how to look ahead. And I think that's the toughest one is the looking ahead part because we don't really know how much our world is going to change in the next week or so. I feel like the guidance changes. We can, you know, have groups of 10 and then we'll have groups of 25 or whatever. Um, we'll be able to use certain spaces again. So we really need to just constantly be iterating about what our solutions are. Are they doing the right things? Um, are, are, we, are we helping the right people? And, and just call, kind of always just think a little bit further than we, than we are in our, you know, our lockdown mode. So I wrote this story a few years ago, and uh, it is actually an anti-sidewalk sidewalk story. <laughs> and I think the point for me was I spent a whole year trying to figure out why sidewalks were such a problem for cities. Why couldn't cities build them, you know, and keep them maintained and keep them fair and keep them safe and all these things that we are, um, we've talked about today about when it comes to equity and infrastructure. And what I decided is that we really just need to get rid of sidewalks. Like the sidewalks are the problem. And we need to make sure that we have these kind of shared streets or uh, streets that are you know, pedestrian dominated and making sure that that's the, the way that we want to connect different parts of our city and help people get around that way. And of course that addresses a lot of accessibility issues as well. It also helps an aging population to be able to have more options for getting around, not just walking, of course, that's a, if you're able to walk, but you can also have many more options for this nice, smooth, well-maintained surface. I think what's been so interesting over the last you know, few weeks and months that what we've seen is that is actually something that people have been demanding. That's been what people want. They want a place to walk. They want a, a good surface to ride a bike. They want somewhere to get outside and, and are kind of seeing that land in front of their own home as a place where they could go. So I just want to meditate on this image really fast. This is uh, from Dongo Cheng, if you don't know who he is, um, amazing engineer in Seattle, a big follow. He uh, shares so many uh, incredible um, uh, just little photos of what they're doing on the streets there. And I just like how he calls this a healthy street. And I look at it and it feels healthy. It feels healthy to me. It's not only has like grass coming up from the middle of it. Um, it's got trees. It's got these nice little planters at the end. And this, the mural was actually done by a school. And I think that this is what we should aspire to. We've, we've talked so much about things like safe streets. Um, we've talked about how we want to address traffic deaths. We've talked about how we want to do, do things like uh, address the uh, heat island effect with our tree canopy, things like that. But I think what we should really be aiming for here is a healthy street. I think healthy conveys not all, all of those issues that we're talking about, but also this idea that we're trying to keep each other healthy and safe that, that everybody understands right now because they have gone through this process of staying home to keep people around them healthy and safe. And for the second topic of protecting essential workers, I know this has been something that we've talked a lot about today and I really appreciated hearing you know, how different transit agencies are addressing this. Um, I wrote this story uh, kind of right at the beginning of the, the crisis and um, it's from the folks who put together the Green New Deal. They made a Green New Deal for transportation. It's completely excellent and it was, you know, put, it was written before we knew this was going to happen and what's amazing is how even more relevant it, it, the recommendations are now. Of course, as you all know what the Green New Deal is, but this is basically a plan for, to get transit, the whole transit sector, city and suburban transit, to 
zero emissions. And I think one of the most critical parts of it is that it really focuses on improving service. Again, that's something we've talked about a lot today. Um, that yes, infrastructure is important. Yes, you know, building is important, but we really need to focus on how we are serving the people who rely on transit the most. And that has really become a key issue during this time when it comes to keeping people safe and healthy and getting them to their jobs. But one thing I thought was really, really cool that has come out of this over the last uh, week or two is, and this is not a very um, sexy tweet that I have um, <laughs> embedded here, but um, this is from Carter Rubin, a, a great friend of mine who works at NRDC. And it's saying that our Metro uh, uh, agency is, they, we have a coronavirus task force and they recommended that Metro is accelerating bus only lanes as a way to ensure frontline workers on buses don't get stuck in traffic and minimize folks in vehicle time. That it took a pandemic for <laughs> that <laughs> to be prioritized is, uh, you know, something that we're, I think we're going to see a lot of with, with recommendations post COVID. But this to me is like the quintessential service and solving a problem that we know is going to be a bigger issue, right? We want people to be able to take transit to go to work if they need to. We want be able to use, them to be able to use transit to go look for jobs. And we know that some people will not be able to have jobs. So that they, are, they don't have jobs to go back to. So we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of when those streets are empty, when those streets don't have cars on them, we're speeding up our buses and keeping them sped up, making sure that people don't have to be on the buses for a long time, making sure that it shows up when it needs to show up and that we can share that information with our riders. I just thought that was a, a wonderful and hopeful moment. And then this one, looking ahead. So this was actually written by a, a coworker, of mine, coworker of mine, Alexandra Lang, and she um, has this wonderful and delightful story about how we should stop whining and embrace winter. And I thought this was particularly relevant for Minneapolis. Um, I think this is, we're, we're, all, we're talking a lot about summer. I think right now what everybody is talking about is, can I go to the pool or when will the beaches reopen or how can I you know, start to have my life back in summer? Summer is not going to be much of a problem because summer is a time when we're outside anyway, when you are in these open air settings, when you are, you know, going, you know, it's not hard to go dine outside or take a picnic to the, lake, to the river and, uh, and hang out in a way that you feel safe. But when winter comes, we are going to see people that are going to be compressed into these small areas again. Um, that's when traditionally other infectious diseases, they have seen a second peak is when it gets colder and people are, you know, getting closer together in these enclosed spaces. spaces. So what I'd really love to see again is this is thinking ahead to how we continue to make these um, transportation choices and, and these different ways that we can move through the city um, to work in winter as well. And I think the, the one of the most key and great examples is doing like, you know, a uh, ice skating freeway under the freeway <laughs> as they've done and they, that they've done here and so for just to look at what is really inspiring I think for Minneapolis is you know I just pulled the this, this great um, tweet from somebody hopefully maybe they're listening um, who talks about how uh, Minneapolis has such an amazing uh, winter biking culture and that the biggest barrier is actually you know not cold it's not wind it's just a safety issue when it comes to being separated from cars so I would hope that as cities are thinking of things like open streets or or ways to make these um, places permanent that we're starting to carve out now how can we make sure that they're also going to be really great for us to be it, really great places for us to be in winter and how we can use them to get around at that time too. So I promised a bonus one uh, and I'll go back to my grandmother who, um, as I said, was uh, grew up in Minneapolis. This is her at White Bear Lake. Um, she also enjoyed um, alternative modes of transportation. Um, she has, uh, I don't know the story about the burrow, burrow donkey, um, but I like that she used uh, skis to get around their neighborhood when they, when they were younger, speaking of outdoor uh, winter activities. And then she was also, um, she joined the army and she was a nurse in the army during World War II. And what I've been doing a lot during this time as we're entering a, a time of a lot of uncertainty has been looking back at her letters because um, when she came back from the war, she came back to, to Minneapolis, 
um, there were going through a lot of the issues that we are now. There were food shortages. There were a lot of times where they uh, weren't able to get certain things. And this age of austerity, I think, is something that we haven't really fully confronted yet. But it also provides a lot of uh, a lot of moments for us to start thinking about how we can use that and and, and answer some of these problems that I've addressed, addressed earlier. And this was something I found of hers. This is from uh, 1946. Um, this is she, she's this is my grandmother on the front page of the St. Paul Dispatch, I guess. Um, and she is uh, featured for mending her stockings, her nylon stockings, uh, using this whole you know regimen that a lot of women uh, did at the time because there was a nylon shortage because all the nylon is being used to make parachutes and ropes for the war effort. And I just think that this is very instructive for our moment, right? Because we are going to have to get, we're, we are going to have to get a little crafty. We are going to have to um, work with limited resources and we're, we're not going to have all the money or uh, the, the um, elements that we need to, to make our, our big plans work that we want to. So we're going to have to get a little, a little creative. And it turns out that this was like a big part of the messaging that, that went out to in cities during this time, right? So this, this idea of make do and mend was actually part of this like pantyhose repair um, call to action that women uh, you know, said to each other at the time. So make do and mend, go through your wardrobe and, and fix it. This idea with food, and we're facing a lot of the same, similar issues with food. And then there was even messaging like this about transportation. And I think that this is, a pretty great way to think about how we're all going to have to do our part and work with what we have and and make uh make do with what with what we have this says walk short distances leave room for those who have longer journeys and i think that speaks to the equity component and it speaks to the safety component and it speaks to all of us kind of doing our part to to build build, build a better city as mary talked about this was a story i wrote yesterday i think there's a lot to be discussed here when it comes to not only who is making these recommendations, but uh, who they are for. And I think we need to take a very, a very deep look at how we are growing together as cities at this time and how we can make sure that we are doing the least amount of harm, especially to people who have kept our cities running this entire time. So that's my final thought for everyone here is, to really make do and mend, right? It, it could mean uh, mend uh, those relationships. It could mean mend the bike paths, mend the bus service, whatever we need to do. Um, but we're, we wanna make sure that we can move forward together and uh, mend our cities. So with that, I would just love to say, thank you so much for having me. And I, usually I say, come visit. Um, you probably can't do that for a while. But um, you can just say hi, and I would love to talk more about any questions you have. Great, thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, let's see, where to start with, we uh, do have some time for some Q&A. Uh, let, me, let me ask you about uh, work from home policies and, um, and where where you see that fitting in in cities of the future not i, I should say work from home as a hi jerry i'm gonna <laughs> our team is coming on board for our our final um shebang but um we i uh, tell me tell me more about where you see that fitting in in the kind of post post covid transportation society of the future and where where do you feel that that fits I loved hearing from Angie, who I, I really appreciate her um, thoughtfulness and, and she just has such a, a great way of explaining the challenges. So it was so good. I hope I can just play that video on loop uh, and, and glean all the information. I actually you know, have been looking at this a lot. I've been trying to write a story about working from home and I have a really good example from when we held the Olympics here in 1984. I don't know if anyone remembers, but um, the biggest fear about Los Angeles hosting the Olympics, and it probably will be if we have the Olympics again here, but it will probably be the same fear, was that um, people wouldn't be able to make it to the events because they get stuck in traffic because the traffic was so bad. So talking about this idea of collective, um, you know, collective action 
um, they really did an amazing job of getting people to not just not always just stay home for the you know three weeks that they had to have all the games set up and all these people moving around from place to place. Um, it wasn't just that they had to stay home. It was just even flexing their work hours just a little bit. Um, or just doing things like carpooling, just very basic and simple, you know, little actions, but they never had traffic the entire time, you know, like congestion, you know, the, everything was just moving very freely the entire time the games happened. And everybody said, well, it's because everybody left town. It can't be possible that these very small changes could have been, you know, what, you know, achieved this. And it's just so funny when they looked at the data, it actually wasn't that many people who had left and actually so many more people had come to the city that it wasn't about there being less people there. So I do think again, that there is, you know, yes, there's incentives, employers, there's all these types of um, things that Angie talked about, which I think are important, like paying people not to park at the, at the office. But I think there is a, another a sense of the, you know, make do and mend <laughs> philosophy mm -hmm. that will get people thinking about um, that working from home can be something that you can do, um, not just for, uh, you know, traffic or air pollution climate, but also just because it takes the burden off of our roadways and mm -hmm. our transit systems for people who need them. Great. Great. Thanks. We've, we've got a couple of questions on a similar theme um, relating to your most recent Curbed article. Um, so one of them asks um, if you could elaborate on your message in the in the article and then also touch on any um, learnings you had in the process um, process of writing that article and let's see particularly around who's making recommendations and who are they for yeah i think and again i i couldn't tell what was going on at first because my mother got covid 19 pretty early on and she was very sick and um, I was very worried about what was going to happen. Obviously, she, I was far away from her and I couldn't do anything to help her. Um, and I, was, I wasn't sure at first if it was just me overreacting because I personally had someone who was mm -hmm. sick, but it felt like what was going on almost from the very beginning was this uh, urgency of we must seize uh, this opportunity. We must uh, make these changes. A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. All these these things that you hear that this like opportunist moment where we immediately had to, you know, look at these blue skies with no pollution or look at the clear roadways and just, you know, this is what we've been fighting for. Let's keep it going. And I just felt all of it was very, um, it was it was offensive to me just as as someone who didn't feel like this was the time to talk about it. But then I also noticed a lot of conversations going on online from a lot of people who were similarly very, very troubled by this, especially when it came to things like opening streets or uh, now a, a conversation around, um, you know, creating these sidewalk dining zones in, in cities, which is these are all great things that we, you know, like we said, we've, we've wanted these in cities for a long time, but we have to be very careful about, especially when we, when we recommend something as part of an emergency order, especially when our cities and our, our states have more power, you know, there's these, they have these emergency powers right now to push things through. Some of them have been very good and very important. We really need to make sure that we know um, who these decisions are being made for. And I think one of the biggest problems that I see is not having enough people who are in the decision making roles in my city and in other cities um, that are going to represent people of color, that are going to represent people who are older in a lot of cases, um, people who are uh, have families and have kids, you know, th these are a lot of things that we need to look at. And when I talk about things like protecting essential workers, I mean, that's really all we need to be doing right now. We, we have to make sure that we are taking care of the people who have taken care of us. Thank you. I have, I have one more question, um, and then I think I'm gonna turn it back to Mary. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we can decouple biking, walk it, and walking, and transit use from the Central American idea of success? Ooh. <laughs> that is a good one. Um, success, I don't know, do we even, what, is, what does success even look like any, anymore after this period? I think success is staying alive and, and making sure that our family stays alive. Um, 
I think there is a status thing going on, uh, which is why you see things like SUVs being very popular. It, you know, not they, they, the sales of those have rebounded, even though people uh, probably have less money than <laughs> they did before. But I guess certain groups of people still have the same amount of money. Um, so you, you look at something like that and, and what that uh, purchase of an SUV is trying to communicate at this exact moment. Uh, maybe it's the size, maybe it's the um, prestige, maybe it's, I don't know, you can drive through anything if, if there's an emergency of some sort. Um, but I think that that, you know, I, I wrote about, for example, um, the way that car ads have um, kind of evolved into this uh, really this conversation, it, now that we even have electric vehicles, like electric Hummers, um, they're still going to try to sell you that, <laughs> even that you're on this, like some kind of premise that it's still like powerful and destructive in a way, but then like great and quiet for the environment. So I think that th there's been another level of propaganda that's been delivered to us um, throughout this, you know, the last few years, especially when it comes to SUVs and I I don't know how you I don't know how you battle that unless you say something like oh we're just going to give you know everybody really nice e-bikes um, and you when you trade in your car and maybe that will get enough people uh, interested in the the sexy e-bike to <laughs> to make that a, a standard of success. That's great. Thanks. Um, you know, uh, let's see. I think I'm going to take this time and turn it turn it back over to Mary. Thank you for, for your stunning presentation and um, answering those questions. And I know we have more from our audience and um, we'll see what we can do to get them answered later. Great, thank you, Becky. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, there, there's no words for, I think, the last three hours we've all enjoyed together. And um, I am going to invite the Move Minneapolis staff to join us. Um, these are the folks who <laughs> helped produce today's event and they deserve a ton of credit. You can see their names, they can wave and there are more, so we'll all join you. Uh, particular thanks today to Loom, our sponsor, to our incredible speakers, Matthew, Michael, Angie, Adi, Jared, and finally Alyssa. Thanks to all the community members and our elected leaders who submitted videos and most of all to you, our audience who stuck with us. And I think you will agree with me, I have had my mind appropriately blown by what we just experienced and I need to actually view this event so that I can do it in a relaxed way, possibly with a cocktail, so that I can truly enjoy what you just said uh, because I think you shake to the world and you shook the world. We recorded the session and it's going to be posted online. Remember, that's moveminneapolis.org, our brand new website just for you. Uh, tell everybody that this is available. There's John. He's got the, got the website up. That's great. Tell, tell everyone, tell your friends, talk about it on social media. Please keep the chatter up. It's very helpful. We want to get the word out and share what our speakers shared with us. So in conclusion, we wish you safety, we wish you prosperity, and we really look forward to building and creating a sustainable future along with all of you. Stay in touch. Let's do this again. Take care and bye.